Well, hello, hearth and homies. Welcome to the OTR Visual Radio. I'm your host, Mr. H. Thanks for joining us for this compilation. Now, just before we get into the show, I want to take a minute to talk to you about the Johnny Dollar Club. What's that? You've not heard of the Johnny Dollar Club? Well, let me tell you about it. As many of you know, this channel is not an ad supported channel, but it does take time and money to keep the channel going and to make these shows. So one of the ways you can help keep us on YouTube is by joining the Johnny Dollar Club. All you need to do is look for the links in the description below or over in the chat or down here if you're on your phone or in the comments. And you can choose between patreon.com or buymeacoffee.com and check out the Johnny Dollar Club. Starting out at just a dollar a month, you can help support the channel and get access to exclusive content. But now let's get on with our show. Sit back, relax, enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's adventure, Norwegian incident, is suggested by an actual incident recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. It was quite a jump from being an associate professor at Wisconsin to the red dust of Camp Rooker. But like most of the guys, I just got used to it. I got used to the clothes, the food. If they let me lie in it a while longer, I might even have gotten used to that army cot. Hey, uh, Anderson. Hmm? You awake? Uh, come on, get up. That's what I like about the army. Everybody's so considerate. Come on, come on. The captain wants to see you. Hey, you oh. too, Ferrillo. Snap to it and get your clothes on. Get up! Hey. What's it all about? How should I know? Ask Private Perillo. He's the guy with all the answers. What'd you do now, Pete? <sighs> Nothing. The captain wants to see us at this time of the night. You must have pulled a beauty. Oh, you nuts. The captain's a pal of mine. Probably wants to know if I'm awake. <laughs> Gentlemen. Gentlemen, what I'm about to say is confidential. Just between the three of us. If you refuse my offer... It will not be counted against you, nor will it go onto your record. I understand, sir. The Office of Strategic Services has requested both of you. Well, I accept. I've always dreamt of having an office job with a pretty whack for a secretary. <laughs> I'm afraid you don't understand. Um, have a cigarette? Huh? Oh, thanks. You see, the job of the OSS is to disrupt enemy activity in every way possible. And one of their most effective methods is to drop men behind enemy lines. Who, oh, me? May I ask why I've been requested, sir? Well, I understand, Corporal Anderson. Your parents come from Norway and that you speak the language. Uh, yes, sir. I've spent most of my last ten summers in Norway. But uh, why me? I have a tough time with English. Well, according to your record, Farillo, you were a sand hog. Well, yes, sir. In civvies, I was a demolition expert. So naturally, the army put me in the infantry. Uh, sir? Uh, yes. Now, uh, this job is strictly volunteer. If you want me to leave you alone for a few minutes... I won't be necessary, Captain. I should have wised up when you give me the cigarette, Captain. Every time I get something for nothing from an officer, I end up in trouble. Basic training turned out to be a maypole dance compared to the grind that the OSS put us through. Since we'd been kids, the word sportsmanship had been drilled into us. Well, the OSS kicked it out. The other team was playing dirty pool, and we had to go by their rules. Jagged edge of a bottle, stiff fingers in the eye, a knee in the groin, the flat of a hand across the neck, became close friends of ours. We slept on the flight across the Atlantic, and finally arrived in London. 
Gentlemen, I will outline your mission to you. As you may have surmised, you're going to Norway. Uh, will you step over to this map? What are you saying? Shut up. A PT boat will take you out tonight. Tonight? In about two hours. You will land at this point. You know the territory, Captain Corporal? Yes, sir. My family came from a village not far from there. You can study these aerial photographs later. There's plenty of cover. Now, here is your mission. This red line, the north to the south, mm -hmm. is the main line of supply. At this point, there's a bridge which you are to blow up. Well, that shouldn't be tough. Blowing it up, no. However, 500 yards from the bridge, right here, there's a German company barracks. The bridge is well protected. It's up to you to figure out a way to dynamite it. Well, how about our Norwegian contact? Who's going to meet us? Well, when you hit the shore, take cover. At precisely 11 o'clock, a man will be strolling down the beach. Stop him, ask him how the fishing is. He'll answer, not too good in winter. From then on, you're in his hands. You, Anderson, are his nephew, and you, Fiorello, are his cousin. Yeah, but uh, I can't speak Norwegian. You will not say anything at any time. You'll be known as the Dumb One. What? The reason you're called the Dumb One goes back to a childhood disease. Oh, now, wait now, a uh, minute. Goodbye, gentlemen, and good luck. <laughs> They flew us to the north of England, hustled us on a boat, and tore off for the coast of Norway. I briefed Pete on the terrain and everything I knew about the bridge. We studied the photographs and rehearsed the parts we were to play. The clothes we were given smelled of fish. They'd been made in Oslo, worn by a Norwegian, and probably picked up in a hock shop in the Bowery. Well, we felt the boat slow down, and Pete and I went topside to get our first glimpse of Norway. Well, this is as close as we can get, gentlemen. Now, one of my men will row you the rest of the way and return with the boat. That's just dandy. How do we get back? According to my orders, you have five days to do your job. On the fifth and sixth nights, we will return at 0200. Fifth and sixth nights? You will signal us from the beach with a flashlight. You know the signal. Uh, we can stay no longer than ten minutes. Well, supposing we can't make it on time. What then? I hope you can. Where's the dynamite? Uh, you're standing right next to it. Uh, those barrels are full of fish. Yes, uh, the top two layers. The rest of the fish have been gutted and filled with plastic containers of dynamite. Uh, in case you are stopped, don't worry about the fish. Uh, they were caught here last night, packed in ice and flown to England. And they're still nice and fresh. Well, if we don't blow up the bridge, we can at least open up a fish store. Let's go. back as we rode to the shore. We listened to the waves hitting the beach. We listened to the stillness that seemed to surround all of Norway. We beached the boat, piled our dynamite behind some bushes, and waited. What time is it, Andy? It's about five minutes past eleven. Now Joe is supposed to be here at eleven. He'll get here. Supposing he don't make it, then what? I've got enough rations for five days. We'll figure out something. You know, they shoot guys who don't wear a uniform behind the enemy lines. What's the matter? You scared? Yeah. So what? So am I. What time is it now? Can't be more than ten after. You ought to... Hold it a minute. Coming down the shore. Yeah, I see him. You stay back in these bushes and keep me covered. I'll work his back toward you. If I get in any trouble, you know what to do. Yeah, I studied real hard. Look, thanks. Good evening, sir. Good evening. A nice night. Dark, but pleasant. Tell me, how is the fishing around here? Not too good in winter. You can come out, Pete. It is good to see you. My name is Janssen. My name is Anderson. This is my partner, Pete Farello. Welcome to Norway, Mr. Anderson, and to you, Captain Farello. Say, I'm going to like this country. The promotions come real quick. I understand you're to lead us to a place where we can hide. Yeah, that is true. My uh, home is safe. For the past ten days, my nephews have been visiting me. Every night they come down to fish and return with two barrels. We won't have too much trouble. What kind of trouble do you expect? Uh, on the road back, we must pass a German sentry. Uh, two of them, to be exact. 
However, you look uh, like my nephew's a little... Won't you run into trouble having four nephews walking around? Eh, no, no, the other two left by sea before you arrived. Uh, they also left uh, their wagon so that we can carry your catch. Say, uh, Pop, ain't you awful old to be mixed up in this sort of thing? Well, what else can an old man do? I've been told that the underground's very well organized in this district. But who's the leader? I am. There were no lights in the houses we passed. There were no people on the roads. This was occupied territory. Fear and hate filled the air. This was Norway with no songs. Unless you can make music out of the heavy tread of a German soldier. We pulled the wagon up the road for about four miles without saying a word. Then we saw the roadblock. Up ahead, the German sentry. Does he understand Norwegian? Yeah, yeah. We took him in after the last war. We brought him up and he promised to come back. They all kept their promise. Nice guys to have around. Pete? Yeah. Your friend plays his part well. Remember, you have traveled this road for over a week. If the sentry is familiar, don't be surprised. Hold your breath, Pete. Remember which fish swallowed the 45. Art! Oh, it is you, Herr Janssen. Yes. Ah. Dark night tonight. Yeah, huh? mine hair. How was the catch? We had a good catch. Well, here, yeah, let me take a look. I'd like to know what they'll be serving us tomorrow. Out of my way, dumb one. I wouldn't mess with the fish. And why not? Uh, the smell. It will stick to your uniform and then the girls will object. <laughs> <laughs> you are smart for a Norwegian. Uh, Janssen, uh, when am I going to get another bottle of that brandy? Uh, tomorrow night I will bring it myself. Hey, dumb one, uh, why aren't you wearing the pants with the patch? Where did you get the new sweater? Oh, uh, I am having them cleaned for him. <laughs> I'll bet he is going to see his girl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Imagine the dumb one with a girl. <laughs> he wouldn't know what to say. <laughs> it is very funny, my hair. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> Move along, Janssen. <laughs> the stink of fish is beginning to hang in the air. <laughs> Go along now. <laughs> yeah. Hey, dumb one. Maybe you will introduce me to your girl. <laughs> I'll bet she looks like a fish. <laughs> guy's got a great sense of humor. We made a move for that barrel of fish. I thought we were done. It was close. Close for him, too. Say, so, uh, Pop, you and that German sentry were real chummy. Ain't that kind of dangerous for the head of the underground? Yeah, for the head of the underground, but uh, I am also the local Christian. We reached his house without any trouble. It had been two very long days, and we were beat. I managed to get my shoes off before I collapsed. And then the sun broke in through the window and I got up. Pete and I went down for breakfast. It wasn't much to eat, so we broke out our rations and treated Jensen and his housekeeper to some real special delicacies. Dried egg and chocolate. Oh, that was good. Real good. <laughs> Don't let the army hear you say that. Huh? They've dried everything up but steak. Uh, Mr. Jensen, are we going to have any... Unexpected visitors? Uh, I do not think so. The Germans very seldom come to my home. Oh, occasionally an officer will drop in, but uh, not often. Uh, how uh, many men will you need? I hope he won't need any. Tonight, Pete and I will take a look at the bridge. How close can we get? Uh, that depends. On what? On uh, how much of a chance uh, you want to take. We've got to get right on it, if possible. When we place the dynamite, it must be done fast. We can't afford to grope. Well, you can walk across. Just like that? If the sentry doesn't stop you, I would uh, suggest that you ask his permission. Is he serious, Andy? Very. See, if we get caught sneaking across, we're liable to be shot. If we can fool the guard at the bridge, we walk across. And supposing we don't fool the sentry? You get shot. There it 
this up ahead. Yeah. Look at that hiney pacing back and forth. Wait a second. Whatever you do, don't say a word. Even if he sticks that bayonet into you, don't say one word. I hope you and that guy hit it off real well. Jensen gave me a good story. It should work. Come on. Good evening, Leutnant. I am a corporal. Not that I wouldn't make a better officer than most of them. What do you want? We would like to cross the bridge. Why? Uh, Mr. Janssen is our uncle. We have a message to deliver. What kind of a message? About a party for the Germans who are barracked here. Hmm. For the officers, I suppose. Let me see your papers. You too. Uh, he is dumb. He cannot speak. He can hear, can't he? Papers. I think all Norwegians are dumb. The party is to be for the enlisted men. Oh, oh, oh. Of course, uh, you understand. I was not referring to Herr Janssen. He is a smart man. He knows which side his bread is buttered. Here are your papers. Go on now. Don't loiter on the bridge. Thank you. Keep your eyes open, Pete. You can only make this trip once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does it look to you? We can do it. Well, it'll take us at least a, an hour to set this stuff. An hour? It's an awful long time. This is an awful big bridge. You're going to have to do a good job the first time. Ah, oh, I see you got back. Did you have any trouble? No, no trouble. I told him that you were going to throw a party for the enlisted man. Yeah. He was quite pleased. Uh, uh, Mr. Ferrillo, you think you can do the job? I can do it all right if I have the time. Uh, it is very important to us. This is their main line of supply from the north. It will cripple them for months. Now what happens after we do this? Well, there will be reprisals. A few more will die. Huh. That's a tough shake. Yeah, no, no. There are times when it is better to die. When do you tend to blow up the bridge? Day after tomorrow. The boat will be there to pick us up. If we blow the bridge at 12, we'll still have two hours. There are more than enough time. Hey, ain't it gonna look bad for you? Your nephew's disappearing the night the bridge goes? Nah, my real nephew will come back on time. We better get some sleep. Now, look, I'd appreciate if you'd have the underground give me a timesheet on the German guards. Yes, sir, yeah. How many, when they change, yeah. where everybody is within a mile. I will have everything tomorrow afternoon. Well, come on, Annie, let's turn in. If I knew that being a spy was gonna be so easy, I'd have bucked for it long ago. <laughs> yeah, things are going easy, all right. Too easy. <laughs> Hey, where you been, Andy? I've been waiting an hour. We got a rod to fool to make, remember? We aren't blowing the bridge tonight, Pete. Well, don't you think you ought to let me in on your plans? It's my neck, too. It's an opportunity we can't afford to pass up. Look, Professor, in this game we play for all the marbles, huh? So stop talking to riddles. According to Jansen, a troop train will be passing through here tomorrow night. The Nazis are moving south, and we can put a real crimp in their plans. Keep talking. Not only do we blow the bridge, but we blow up a loaded troop train. He ain't that shaving it a bit thin. Tomorrow night's the last night we can make that boat, remember? It's up to you, Pete. Stop making me the heavy. I'm willing to do it your way, only I want to know what I'm getting into. That's all there is to it. Well, just one more question. Have you figured out how we uh, get to the beach after the blow-up? Through the, the woods. They're yeah. not crawling with Nazis. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. The commander of that boat said uh, he'd only wait ten minutes. And supposing the woods are crawling with Nazis. Well, we take the big gamble and try to float down the river to the sea. Hope we make it, that's all. Yeah. Well, okay, I vote your way. Since we're here, we might as well do it upright. It's a wonderful opportunity, Pete. Even if it is a big gamble. I don't mind a gamble. I just hope the dice ain't loaded. We sat for hours and watched the darkness. At 11, we looked at our watches, thought about the PT boat anchored offshore. There were a lot of ifs in our plans, 
If the moon didn't shine, if the Germans didn't wise up, if the train wasn't late, if the guards weren't doubled. We spent a long night and a long, long day waiting for it to get dark again, when Jensen burst into the room. You, uh, you will have to change your plans. We can't. We're set to leave in 30 minutes. Downstairs, a Gestapo major. A what? Somebody talked. Uh, I don't know. He says he's... Um, Looking for someone. That's just dandy. Uh, he was here some weeks ago. He met uh, both of you. I, I mean, my real nephews. Come on, stop thinking, Andy. We can't walk past him with our arms full of dynamite. Can't you get rid of him? No, no. When he is in this district, he, he spends the night here. He sent me for you. Oh, great. I, um, I think you can fool him, Anderson. You resemble my nephew, Arne. Closely, but uh, then he's a dumb one, I don't know. Yeah? Well, he better be fooled, because I'll be carrying a forty-five under my shirt. Come on, Pete. If we can bluff this through, we've got a chance. Jansen, bottle of brandy. Uh, oh, there you are. Didn't see you standing in the doorway. But I can see the bottle. Bring it here. Yeah? Uh, right, uh... Away, Major. Anna, come in. I want to talk to you. Yeah, mine here. I understand Norway is playing host to a couple of American spies. What? That is impossible, mine here. Impossible, but true. However, I shall catch them and teach them a lesson. Do you know what they look like, mine here? Of course, I do not know what they look like, you stupid loud. Do you think they go around singing Yankee Doodle Dandy? Oh, no, mine here. More brandy. This bottle's empty. It's I will get some. No, no, no. Send the dumb one. Go ahead, go. It's odd. I could have sworn last time I was here he was stoop-shouldered. Hey, dumb one! Uh, first the brandy. Well, of course, the brandy. That's what brings me back to this miserable place. Well, I am glad something brings you back. Yeah, I'm sure you are. You probably hate me. Oh, mine hair, you, you do me an injustice. Oh, of course. You are one of our dear quizlings. <laughs> How about you, Anna? How much do you hate me? No, mine hair. No, mine hair. Yeah. You were almost as dumb as the other one. Where is he? Uh, he's right here with the brandy. Oh. Give it to me, dumb one. Yeah. Oh. He opened it for me. Oh, nice. Thank you, dumb one. Anna, come here. Take off my boots. Yeah, mine here. You ought to lick them. I could send you to it. What has happened to your hair? Jansen, I thought your nephew... What was that? Oh, oh the dumb one, he dropped the tray. Clumsy fool. Ah, brandy should be drunk from a bottle. Ah. <clears throat> this is brandy. Jensen. It has been a long... Yeah. Huh? I, I don't understand that he could drink two gallons and not even get a little drunk. Well, he's getting plastered now. He'll be out for at least ten hours. I don't understand it. Well, I don't know what the Norwegian word is, but in Brooklyn we call it a Mickey. <laughs> Just over this ridge. We're late, Andy. That train is doing less than an hour. Well, you'll just have to work faster, that's all. Hold it. What now? I got guards in the woods. Yeah, I see them. It's going to be tough to get around them and slip under the bridge. That would take us over an hour. We'd miss the boat. We'll have to walk the road right to the bridge. What about the sentry? We have to get rid of him and pray that we have time to set the dynamite before they discover him. So we hit them together? You walk about a pace behind me. I've got to get close enough to use a knife. It's got to be the first time, so don't mess. Good evening. Oh, it's you. Don't you pay any attention to the curfew? 
What has he got in the package? Come here and let me... Oh! For a college man, you sure learned a lot of things. Now, look, you'll have to set the dynamite alone. I'll slip on his coat and stay here. Pretend I'm the sentry. I'll set it as quick as I can. Lock. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I wish I had more time, but I think this will do it. Let's start moving. We can't. What do you mean we can't? I didn't time fuse it. What? We had to stay and set it off. Why? Look, supposing the train is late, the, the time fuse would miss. We stayed this long. We might as well finish your job, huh? Where's your detonator? About 100 yards back. Lead the way. Okay. I didn't, I didn't have time to bury the wire. Hope nobody trips over it. <laughs> the bridge looks like a Christmas tree, you know? More wires than American TNT. Well, all we can do now is wait. Yeah. Gee, I wish I could smoke a cigarette. So do I. Uh, might as well get comfortable. How much time we got to get to that boat, huh? Less than 50 minutes. Huh. Too late to go through the woods? Too late. Well, it's always the river. It's going to be tough. Half a railroad will be drifting with us. Don't worry about that later. We're going to be sitting ducks when our bridge goes. It'll be like noon. Attention! A guard has been killed! Ah, looks like they found our friend, eh? Attention! It's really going to get crowded here in about... Attention! Hey, hey, here comes a commuter special. That's our target. Look at it snake along. It's getting closer. Wait till it hits the middle and then push the plunger. You'll take the whole bridge, you know. Make sure you get the cars. I know what to do. I'll tell you I know what, what to do. Five, four, three, two, one, now. <laughs> Pretty, ain't it? A hurry up jab, you did fine. You should have seen what I did for graduation. Down the slope and into the river. Yeah, I'm right behind you, pal. <laughs> Here's our private car. Grab a hold of that beam. None. I got it. Why, right, those fires make a beautiful sight. I'm too busy to be an HLR. Well, don't let go. The current will drag you right down. I'm holding, I'm holding. Good. Had a worse cold. This will take us close to the rendezvous. It's, it's real cold. Hey, Andy. Yeah? When we get back to camp, remind me to tell you about a dame I know in Brooklyn. What about her? She gave me the air for a lifeguard. Because I couldn't swim. <laughs> The blowing up of the railroad bridge in Norway cut a German lifeline and paralyzed their Norwegian forces for months. Besides the loss of military strength from the troop train, much needed ore and food was kept out of Germany. This was another blow struck toward the final invasion. And once more, the report of an OSS agent closed with the words, Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak... And dagger. Heard in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Andy was Joseph Julian. Pete was played by Ralph Bell. Jansen, Raymond Edward Johnson. The German major was Barry Kroger. The guard, Jerry Jarrett. The sentry, Frank Behrens. The American captain was played by Carl Weber. The script for today's Cloak and Dagger adventure was written by David Harmon. The music was under the direction of John Gard. Sound effects by Chet Hill and Dick Gillespie. Today's OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program is produced by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Programs. Get your programs here. The American album of familiar music returns over most of these NBC stations 
next Sunday, August 27th. Designed, as always, to bring you the best in Sunday evening musical listening, the American Album of Familiar Music will be back next Sunday. And on Sunday, September 10th, Theater Guild on the Air returns with dramatizations featuring top performers from Broadway and Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS. Ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Warfare, espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's story, The Black Radio, concerns an OSS agent who broadcast allied propaganda from behind the enemy lines and is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. It was one of those quiet days. The sun was splashing in through the windows, and I was marking time until lunch in the cafeteria. And uh, a date I had with the red-headed secretary. There were just the two of us in the big gadget room of the OSS in Washington. Just me and Hank Martin. Then all of a sudden, Hank grabbed my arm. Mark, get down! Air raid, duck! Okay, okay, what's the big idea? <laughs> oh, boy, I wish I had a camera just then. Brother, did you look scared? All right, what was that thing you just threw in a wastebasket? <laughs> just a little noisemaker. Great, if you get in a tight spot and want to start a riot. All right, look, let's start from the beginning, huh? How does it work? Well, like you see, it's not very big, just about the size of a lemon. Easy to slip into your pocket. All you do is pull out the cap and throw it, and when it explodes, pow! We call it the Hedy Lamar. <laughs> Major Langer, I have a job for you. Yes, sir. When our armies cross the Rhine into Germany, the Freiburg will become a strategic city. The less resistance we get from the people when we make that advance, the less lives will be lost. Up to date, we have no report of any underground or partisan movement there. Mm -hmm. And OSS wants me to go in there with a black radio and soften them up, is that it, sir? Right. Cut in on the Nazi local stations. Broadcast the information we want them to get. Mm -hmm. Another of our agents infiltrated that area over three months ago to get acquainted with the city and locate suitable hiding places for the radio. Uh, of course, sir, it'll have to be moved every time we use it. Yes, that's right. Now, we haven't heard from our agent since she was sent in. Uh, we didn't want her to run the risk of trying to contact us. Uh, uh, did you say she, Colonel? <laughs> That's right. Have you any objection to working with a woman, Major? Oh, no, sir. Uh, I mean, no, sir. Mm -hmm. Her name was Lucille, the colonel said. I wondered if she was anything like the redhead, Miss Lucille. Nobody had heard from her for months. Maybe she'd been caught. Maybe the Nazis had twisted out of her the reason she'd been sent to Freiburg. Maybe, maybe I'd have a reception committee of Germans waiting for me. It gave me something to think about on the plane flying over the Black Forest in Germany a few weeks later. There's your rendezvous point straight ahead, Major. Uh, straight ahead and straight down, you mean? Running in. Ready? Ready? Go. Good luck. I tossed the radio out first, then I jumped after it. No matter how many times I jumped, it was always the first time. The feeling of falling. Sick feeling. Like a dream. I came to with a jolt. A sharp pain across my thighs from the pull of the strap and the crack of the chute. Then, air. All around me. I looked down on a black forest that was blacker than ever at 0400. 
four o'clock in the morning. There were no Germans waiting, but no Lucille either. There was nothing but a foreign country, and up above the plane faded away. Then it was gone, and I was alone. <laughs> The radio had floated to Earth about 50 feet away. I checked it, made sure it was all right, buried my parachute, and wondered what to do next. There was a milk wagon coming down the road. I could hear the milk can swaying with the movement of the cart. I could see a shadowy figure holding the reins. I dragged the radio behind a clump of bushes, and then I waited for the wagon to pass. For a moment, I didn't recognize the song. And then, all of a sudden, the words wrote themselves in my head. Come away with me, Lucille, in my merry old... Lucille! Lucille! I'm sorry I was late, Major Lang. A German soldier I know stopped to talk. I couldn't break away without being impolite. Oh, just as long as you got here. Hurry, Major, let's go. Yes, I was ever so glad to see anyone in my life. Gee. But I, uh, I didn't quite expect to meet uh, a milkman. <laughs> what did you think I'd be like, huh? Oh, I, I... Uh... <laughs> come, come, Major. Well, I, I had no idea. <laughs> no doubt you picture the slim young thing who'd add interest to your intrigue, huh? <laughs> Uh, I've been neither slim nor young for longer than I'd like to remember. Uh, tell me, what did you do before the war, Lucille? Taught history in grade school. Mm -hmm. Now I'm helping to make it. It's a good feeling. Until you consider the possibility of getting caught. Well, we've got to make sure we don't get caught. There is always that possibility, Major. Accept it. And it's much easier to take it if it comes. <laughs> Yeah, who is it? May I, uh, may I come in? Well, uh, what do you want? It's your neighbor across the hall. I, I wish only to make your acquaintance. My name is Gruber. Am I disturbing you, Helanga? Well, you uh, know my name, I see. As a, as a poor old widower, alone in this world with very few interests outside of the future of the fatherland, that is, I make it my business to know everyone in this roomy house. Oh, do you? Uh, um, you arrived in Freiburg only a few days ago, nine? That's right. Uh, you have a medical discharge from the army. You are wounded at Anzio. Is there uh, anything about me you don't know? Oh, no, 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 no. Do, do not take offense, my friend. I asked the landlady about you. It was she who told me. Your information is right, Herr Gruber. Yeah. I was wounded. Yeah. I spent two months in a hospital. Yeah. And I'd like to be left alone. Yeah. Oh, oh you are bitter. Yeah. A civilian life will not be easy, but you must mix with people, make friends. Don't keep too much to yourself. Now, here, I brought with me this <coughs> bottle of schnapps and two small glasses. Ah. Will you not join me? Well, uh... Ah, here, here. To the future, Herr Langer. Well, I'll drink to that. <laughs> There was something about the old windbag who rented the room next door to me on the third floor that I didn't like. I couldn't put my finger on it. Maybe it was the way his eyes, like patent leather buttons, kept darting around the room. Hey, good schnapps, nein, Herr Langer? Uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah, very good. Not like we used to get before the war. Uh, of course, I'm not complaining. <laughs> it, it's such a little sacrifice to make for the right. Yes, of course, yes. Uh, what are you planning to do here in Freiburg, Langer? Well, I uh, have my craft card as a union motion picture projectionist. Yeah. I uh, worked in a film house in Berlin before the war and oh. was hoping to find a position here. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you had uh, no success yet? Uh, no, no, not yet. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the motion picture house, a block from the mining university. Uh, have you tried there? Well, no, I haven't. Oh, do, 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 do to try it. Tell the manager, Herr Schmidt, that you are a friend of mine. He's Always complaining to me about being short of help. Uh, but that also is just a little sacrifice to make for the Reich, of 
Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Doc, I'll go there tomorrow. Oh, uh, tell me, uh, what uh, is, is your business, McRuber? I? Oh, I am a clerk. A clerk? Yeah, in the administration building of Gestapo headquarters. More schnapps? Uh, yeah, more schnapps. I may not have liked the old windbag, but I took his lead anyway. I went to the movie house near the university and got myself a job there on a day shift. And I counted the hours until the Thursday, when I'd meet Lucille at the deserted car barn we'd agreed on. On Wednesday, I was in the projection room running a half-hour newsreel, most of which was a close-up of Hitler making a speech in Berlin and falling at the mouth. I looked down over the heads of the audience. Wondered if all of them were as enthusiastic about the Fuhrer as they pretended to be. Wondered how much it would take to push them into starting their own underground. Wondered how many of them would be listening to their radio the next night. Listening to me. Uh, how long ago? Uh, yeah, Schmidt. Uh, I came to tell you... Uh, I'll turn that speaker down, will you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I uh, came to tell you you may have tomorrow afternoon off. Uh, tomorrow afternoon? But I don't understand. Um, I will want you tomorrow night instead. Oh, but tomorrow night is impossible. I, I mean... Longer, you have a good job here. If I ask you to take the night shift this once, I see no need for argument. Oh, but, uh, you see... Is what you have to do that important that it cannot be postponed? Uh, nine. Hey, Schmidt, not so important. I'll be here. The next night at 20 minutes past 10, the feature film went off. I set the machine. The newsreel would run by itself for half an hour. No more. It didn't give me much time before the reel would run out. Just a half hour to get to the car barn, broadcast, and get back. Now well, that's it, Lucille. 730 kilocycles, but I can't seem to get reception. Ah, oh, they are signing off. This is Reichstation KL Day signing off. Until tomorrow morning, Heil Hitler. Well, here we go. Keep your fingers crossed. Don't turn off your radios, people of Freiburg. This is for you. I am your voice of freedom, bringing you news as it actually exists, not as the propaganda ministry would like you to believe. Mark, that's good, wonderful. It wasn't 50 sons of Freiburg who died at the Anzio beachhead, but 500. You mothers, wives, sweethearts who have not heard from your men. You think the males are slow? Is that why you haven't received letters? Your men will never write again. They were killed at Anzio. Women, they are taking your men away. What do you have for compensation? You have no food. You're cold. And the political leaders want to sacrifice everything but themselves. Haven't you sacrificed enough? Mark, it's late. It's all right. And now, until another time soon, this is the voice of freedom. Good night. I will not say Heil Hitler. I say instead, God be with you. The first of many. God be with us both. <laughs> We dismantled the radio. I lifted it into the back of the milk wagon, ran as fast as I could back to the theater, and slid in through the side door. And then I heard it. Hey, Lango! Lango! Where were you? Oh, Herr Schmidt? Well, I... I uh, what I... business had you to leave the protection room during the newsreel of the Führer? I only hope the authorities do not hear of this. Our leader cut off in the middle of his speech. Where, where were you? Where, where was I? Uh, I, I? I was in the washroom. I the was washroom. just going up to see if you had fallen asleep. Adolos, go fix the machine quickly. Uh, uh, when, uh, when, when did this happen? Happened just a minute ago, natürlich. It's a wonder you couldn't hear all the disturbance from the washroom. Also, mach schnell, los. Ja, 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 ja. I ran up the stairs to the projection room. God must have been with me that first night. If the machine had broken down five minutes earlier, Herr Schmidt would have known I'd left the theater. <laughs> The next week, and the next, and the next, we were on the air. 
We moved the radio to a deserted warehouse, to a cave in the black forest, to a barn on the outskirts of town. As the voice of freedom, I told the people of Freiburg, you are fighting a lost cause. The losses of the Luftwaffe are 75% higher than reported. Resistance in all German-occupied territory is growing stronger. People in the city looked the same, were as respectful as ever to the Nazi soldiers that walked the streets. None of them showed by so much as a look or a word that they ever heard those broadcasts. And then I received my first indication. I saw you through the window of the coffee shop, Herr Langer. Uh, may I join you at your table? If you'd like. Oh, thank you. There. So, have you been listening to your radio lately? I uh, have no radio. Well, if you get one, then, I advise you not to listen to Reichstation KL Day. Oh, why not? Because the Gestapo will arrest anyone caught listening to the man who calls himself the Voice of Freedom. What does he talk about, this uh, voice of freedom? Oh, it's, it's, it's nonsense, of course. Allied propaganda nonsense. You sure you have never heard him? I told you, Herr Gruber, I have no radio. Oh, but of course. I forgot. <sighs> Why is it, Herr Lange, I have the feeling I've seen you somewhere before? It was ridiculous to suppose that he had ever seen me before, but he told me one thing. The people were listening. And the Gestapo was looking for me. Mark, with that cough of yours, perhaps I'd better broadcast tonight. No, 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 I'll be all right. <coughs> people of Freiburg, this is your voice of freedom. I want to tell you, my friends, how step by step Hitler has developed his program. Step by step, he has carried it out successfully. First, he took our men and destroyed them. And now Hitler is destroying our cities and our factories. Allied bombings will destroy all Germany. <coughs> our men are already dead in a hundred battlefields. This is the Fuhrer's greatest achievement for Germany. He is accomplishing it all in less than 12 short years. Twelve short years of Hitlerite success. They are jamming the radio, Mark. You'd better sign off. It's all right. <coughs> this is the voice of freedom saying good night. I will not say Heil Hitler. I say instead, God be with you. I'm afraid they may be closing in. Yes, Lucille, it's the first time they've jammed our broadcast. We'll have to move fast. Dismantle the radio and get out of here. The wagon is right outside. Hurry. Less than five minutes later, we'd left the basement of the schoolhouse near the cathedral. It was quiet in the streets. Too quiet. As if the city were holding its breath. Waiting for something to happen. Good night. Until Friday. You know the place. Yes. Well, let me take the radio no. tonight. Oh, back to your room with it under your arm. What foolishness. Yes, but Lucille, you always take the risk of being caught with I it. have the milk wagon to hide it. And the barn to bury it. Oh, hey. We'd better not stand here any longer. Good night again. And take care of that car. I started to walk quickly in the opposite direction. If German triangulation had found the general location of the radio, the neighborhood would be swarming with Gestapo any minute. The headlights of the official car came out of nowhere around a corner and blinded me. Halt! Here you are! Halt! Halt! I started to run. Halt! I ducked into a doorway, up the stairs to the roof, across the roof, down some stairs again, back into the street. Somehow, I'd shaken them. I was free of them. I had to find somewhere to go, somewhere to hide. The movie house where I worked was close by. I went in through the side door. Punched down in a seat, anonymous in the darkness. I was one of hundreds of people watching the travel. And then something happened to the film and the soundtrack went sour. You people listen to me? 
There will be no more film tonight, not to be reject the identification of every man in this theater. One by one, cut, cut. We are looking for a man who is seen coming into this theater through the side door. A man who is wanted for questioning by the Gestapo. You will file out the exit one by one and row by row with no talking. Women to the right, men to the left. There will be no more... Maybe my forged identification would pass inspection easily. But the men who were chasing me had a general idea of my height and weight. I couldn't take the chance. I put my hand in my pocket and pulled out a round disc about the size of a lemon. The noisemaker OSS called the Hedy Lamar. I yanked out the cap and threw it. It started a riot, all right. The soldiers couldn't hold them back. They practically walked over them in their rush to get out. And I walked out, too. Swept along in the tide of panic. Guten Tag, Herr Langer. Uh, you are uh, Gruber. just on your way to work, I see. Uh, I will walk with you part way. Well, if you'd like... Tonight, when you get home from your work, listen to your radio. I told you I have no radio. Ah, oh, yeah, I do keep forgetting. Uh, you are welcome to listen to mine, then. There's to be an important announcement at seven o'clock. Announcement? About what? I, I learned about it this morning at the administration building where I work. Yes? Uh, there's to be a hanging in the square at noon tomorrow, and a lying spy who was caught with a radio. What did you say? A woman, a spy. She was picked up last night, driving a milk wagon. Can you imagine such a... You look, are you ill, Helena? Uh, I haven't been well. Uh, cold. They haven't caught the man yet. The, the one who calls himself the voice of freedom. But I have no doubt they will soon. They're offering a large reward. Oh, are they? <coughs> they it's a very bad cold, Helena. Uh, tonight, when you return from work, uh, remind me to give you some of my cough medicine. It's very... Uh, oh, I, I turn off here. Um, be the same. <laughs> I didn't stop by for the cough medicine. After work, I locked myself in my room and stayed up all night, looking out of the window, up at the ice blue stars that hung over Germany. And I tried to think of something to do to help Lucille. Before noon the next day, I went to the square, but I still didn't have the answer. Isn't it frightening, Helaga, the way an execution will draw the people like flies to honey? Is it fascination, do you think, of seeing someone else suffer? You tell me, Herr Gruber. You should know you're here. Ah, so I am. But then, so are you. Work! Work! Woman, have you anything to say before you die? People of Freiburg, remember what you heard on your radios. Remember what the voice of freedom told you. It was the truth. The truth. Your leaders are betraying you. Goodbye, citizens of Freiburg. I will not see Heil Hitler. I see instead. God be with you. It happened quickly. It was all over. And I hadn't done a thing to stop it. Yes, who is it? Only I, Herr Gruber. Go away, will you please? Go away, I don't want to talk to anyone. You said, are you my friend, about the hanging this afternoon? No. No, I... I, I just don't feel well. Now, don't torment yourself this way. There was nothing you could do to prevent it. She did not expect it. What are you talking about? Trust me. You have no one else to trust. The Gestapo is going to check and cross-check every man's papers, every man in Freiburg. Are you sure you can stand a thorough investigation, Langer? Well, you're crazy. Are you accusing you me? You are the voice of freedom. I suspected it for a long time. I was never sure. I was afraid to step forward soon. Now, look. No, 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 no. Listen to me. I know you don't like me. I have not liked myself for years. I'm afraid of my own shadow. I'm afraid to think... Afraid. Afraid. 
but no longer. A Gruber, look. I am a discharged soldier from the Wehrmacht. I, told I have you, my... Your face looked familiar. It was not your face. But it was something about you. Your voice. I thought I recognized it. And then I started to think... Think. I who had been afraid to think for years. You came to Freiburg about the same time the broadcast began. You were, you, you were too ignorant of what was going on. And then, yesterday, you coughed, as he had. I was almost sure then. Now, today, I watched your face when she was hanged. And then I knew. Her group Trust group. me. You have no one else. <laughs> He was right. I had no one else. And I had to get out of Freiburg. Gruber offered to drive me across the bridge that night. From there, it would be only a few miles to the border of France. With his official pass from Gestapo headquarters, Gruber would be able to get past the guard. I got into the trunk of the car. It was open just enough to let me breathe. I still didn't know whether to trust him. There was a pretty big price on my head. The car slowed down when we reached the bridge. Let me see your identification. What? There you are. Mm -hmm. What is your business outside of Freiburg? Official business for the administration. Well, this looks all right. I have orders to search all cars. Well, you can see there's nothing in mine. Please, uh, will you hurry? I'm. Uh, this is official business for the Gestapo. One moment, one moment, not so fast. What's in your trunk? The trunk? <laughs> Well, go see for yourself. I have an American spy there. I, I'm smuggling him across the boat. <clears throat> Don't be impudent. You understand? I, I'm i sorry. I was just having my little joke. Well, I don't like jokes. You work as a clerk for the administration, so your head swells. You think you're Himmler. All right, pass. I, I'm sorry. All right, pass. <laughs> Quickly, quickly, get out here. Yeah. I, I, I want to apologize for the things I thought when you told the guard what you did. It was the only thing I could think of at the moment that would prevent him from searching the trunk. Well, goodbye. Yes. And yes. thank you, thank yes, you, my friend. friend. No, wait. Look, don't feel the woman died for nothing. She did not. You and, and she have given us the courage to look at ourselves in the mirror. We, we will continue to talk in whispers, yeah, but after you have gone, there will be many of us who will no longer think in whispers. Uh, yes, well, I, uh, you, you go. Go, go, go. Goodbye, goodbye. Be the same. Major Mark Langer made his way back to Allied Lines, and when Freiburg was taken over some months later, it offered little resistance thanks to the strong underground that had been encouraged by the black radio. And thus, once again, the report of another OSS agent closes with the words, Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak and Dagger. <laughs> Heard in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Mark was Larry Haynes, Lucille, Lily Darvatz, and Gruber, Barry Kroger. Others were Raymond Edward Johnson, Arnold Moss, Stefan Schnabel, Bob Weil, and Jerry Jarrett. Script was written by Winifred Wolf and Jack Gordon. Music was under the direction of John Garth. Sound effects by Chet Hill, Dick Gillespie, and Art Cooper. Today's OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program was produced by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's mystery and music tonight on NBC. The mystery is Sam Spade's latest case in which the romantic private eye solves the caper of too many clients. The music is the NBC Symphony Summer Concert with Antal Durati as guest conductor and the American album of familiar music, one of radio's best-loved musical programs which returns to the air tonight. Three times mean good times on NBC.
Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Warfare, espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's story, A War of Words, concerns an American agent who personally delivered a message to the colonel of a Japanese camp and is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. Okay, Harry, I've spotted it. There's our target. Check. Ready to let him go? Ready. Bombs away! There she goes. I dropped every one of those bombshells we had in the plane, and they hit the target right on the nose. And the explosion that followed sounded like this. Just as much noise as paper makes when it flutters to the ground. Those were our bombshells. Propaganda leaflets. Leaflets designed by OSS to lower the morale of the Japanese soldiers in that camp in Burma. Those were our silent weapons. I'm going to turn back now. Okay, Pete. Uh, Harry, what do you think of that phonied up picture of the bombing at Tokyo we just dropped? Looked authentic to me. <laughs> well, and I like that little pamphlet, too. You know, the one that began to... Uh, Sons of the rising sun, <laughs> it is better to surrender than fight without bullets or die of starvation in the jungle. Yeah, that one was real cute. <laughs> yeah, it sure ought to give those lousy Japs something to think about. I... Sorry, Harry, I... I shouldn't have said that. That's okay, Pete. Forget it. Let's beat our own record, get him back this time, huh? Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Sometimes the guys forgot that Harry was short for Haruyoshi, Haruyoshi Nabura. And though I like to think of myself as an American Japanese, even Pete Barno thought of me as a Japanese American. I had to learn not to be too sensitive. Come in, boys. Come on in. Oh, thank you, Colonel. Sit down. Cigarette? Thank you. Now, you two have done a good job in the past few months peppering Burma with that propaganda material. Oh, here's a light, Harry. Thank you. And uh, we already have begun to uh, see the results. Oh, how's that, Colonel? Well, you know how live Japanese prisoners used to be at a premium. Rather than be captured, they'd commit harakiri, almost in defiance. Oh, yeah, I, I, I hear a lot of them are surrendering lately. That's right. Their morale isn't what it was. Good. And you, too, can take part of the credit for that. But uh, tomorrow... Tomorrow, I want you to go one step further. Well, listening, sir. Uh, take a look at this document. Uh, what is it? Chinese or Japanese? Mm -hmm. Well, Greek to me. I can tell you what it is, Pete. It's obviously a forged order to the commander of the Japanese camp to withdraw his troops three miles east. Well, I hope it's not an obvious forgery to him, Lieutenant Nabura, because if he falls for it and moves his camp, our armies will have a clean road right into Bamo. And once we get there, Burma's practically in our hands. Oh, I see. Oh, begging your pardon, Colonel, but Certainly. what are we supposed to do to walk into that Jap camp and deliver these uh, orders? Oh, no, no. Your job is much simpler. 
All you have to do is fly over the OSS Detachment 101 at Assam and drop this document. The Cochin natives and our agents there will do the rest. We've contacted them by radio. They expect it. Check, Colonel. <laughs> yeah, this will be a snap. Nothing to it. <laughs> into a chap zero. Right back at you, buddy! Now he dived too fast for you, Harry. I'm gonna grab more sky. Maybe you can lose him up there. He's on a tail. Maybe not for long. Hang on, boy! Most of the way up, the air was thin enough so that I could see the nose of that zero following us. And then at 7,000 feet, the air became thick and we lost him. But the plane had taken quite a beating. How bad is the look, you Pete? Well, we haven't more than 50 miles to go. Then we can set down in Cutchin territory, make repairs before heading back to India. Okay. Instead of dropping that document, we'll deliver it in person when we get there, huh? If we get there. What? What's that wing? It's coming off or he hit us. There she goes. What do we do now? I'm gonna kick the stick forward as hard as I can. Put her in a loop. Oh, that's crazy. Now that'll toss us backwards out of the cockpit. Don't pull your ripcord before you fall free of the plane. We'll land in the river. Now keep your feet dry. Here we go. We fell free of the plane. I jerked the ripcord and my chute opened. On the way down, I inflated my May West and the little lifeboat swelled up. Below me, I could see Pete drifting slowly in the Brahma Putra River. And then I hit the water. Boy. <laughs> ah, this is a nice mess to be in. Not even sure exactly where that 101 detachment's located. It's somewhere to the south, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, that's a help. Whew. Whew. Jungle stinks, doesn't it? I can think of a lot of places I'd rather be. For instance? For instance, anywhere. This place is probably crawling with enemy patrols. Ooh, well, that's a pleasant thought. Be careful, oh. careful. Don't trip over those roots. The jungle was heavy and oppressive. The tall trees spread a canopy over our heads and shut out what little sun there was. After a few miles, our shirts were ripped to shreds on the brambles and blood ran into our eyes from the leeches on our foreheads. And then Pete stopped short. Harry, look. The river. What river? What is it? The Brahma Putra, where we land it. You see it? See it to the right? I don't get it. We passed it a few miles back. Yeah, we sure did. You see that clump of roots? They look familiar? That's where you almost tripped right there by the swamp. But... I pay you. Yeah, huh? We made a nice big circle. <laughs> We're right back where we started. How the devil did we do that? Well, anything could happen in this lousy... Hurry. Jap patrol. Oh, well, this just isn't our day. They're coming this way quick. The swamp. They'll never, they'll never see us. Let's get in the water till they pass. All right. That's it. Now get down. Just keep your nose up to breathe. If you have to, get down under and don't breathe. All right. Better thing. Get up, Bob. Oh, reached out and untied their shoelaces. Let's get out of here. That night, we lay side by side, deep in the jungle, on top of coarse undergrowth, underneath the trees from which lianas hung down like braided ropes. We shifted our positions every few minutes as a regiment of ants and bugs crawled into our clothing and kept us awake. And then towards morning, we fell asleep, exhausted. When we awoke, the sun had found a hole in the branches and crawled through. Oh, boy, that sun's hot. Is it? 
What do you mean, is it? I'm cold, Pete. I got the shakes. Fever? I don't know. I just feel sick. I'm sick of my stomach. We can't sit here. You think you can travel? Huh? Oh, sure. Come on. Boy, that sun's blazing, isn't it? Well, I thought you said you had the shakes. Huh? Oh, nothing, nothing. Well, come on, Harry. Come on now, up on your feet, boy. You'll be all right. Yeah. Come on, boy, that's it. Come on. There we go. We started walking again. Our wrists had open sores on them from jungle rock. My head was hot, my hands were cold. And I felt sick. Awful sick. Harry, how do you feel? I'll be okay. Uh, it was that swamp we hid in. Just those lousy bugs that got under your skin, eh? I'll be all right. Uh, uh, Harry. Harry. Can you hear me? Harry. Harry. Okay, fella, now just take it easy there. That's it. This cold cloth on your forehead will make you feel better. You'll see, boy. Pete? Yeah. Yeah, it's Pete. Where am I? <laughs> Couldn't you say anything more original than that for crying out loud? <laughs> I blacked out the now, night. Now, don't talk so much. You blabbed enough when you were off your head. Uh, who's, uh, Okasan? A girl I knew at UCLA. I figured. How long ago has it been since? You know. Two days. Have we got enough rations? Yeah, we'll be okay. Uh, don't lie to me. I said we'll be okay. Now, don't try to sit up, Harry. Well, how far do you think we are from the Cutchins? Well, I think I've got the direction pretty well mapped out now. About a day's travel. Due south. Well, not if you sit here with me for a week. Now, no, no, don't talk uh, so go much. Go on, Pete. Get out of here. I'll tell you what. If you make it there by yourself, you can come back with some of the natives and get me. Not on your life. I'm not leaving you. But, gee. Shh, shh. Quiet. Someone's outside. Pete threw his gun and crawled out from out of the cave. My head was pounding harder than before. Maybe. Maybe it was the fever. Maybe it was because I had to lie there helpless while Pete went out alone to whatever was outside. Do not shoot! Friend and friend! Who are you? Uh, Maybe shooting. Scout, I'm scout. Saw you this morning from top of tree. Saw you at book. Saw uh, uniform. Yeah, yeah, you've got good eyesight. But you still haven't told me who you are. I told you. I'm shooting. Scout. Cutchin, scout. Cutchin, cutchin. Uh, well, why didn't you say so? You're from Assam. You're... You... You're from the OSS detachment? He's right. Oh. Harry! Harry, did you hear that? Well, how's this for the mountain coming to Mohammed? It's great. It's just great. Would like I take you to camp? Would like? Oh, boy, would love. Oh, look, I've, I've got a sick friend in here in the cave there. Uh, a fever. Can you fix him up? We'll see. I looked up from the bed of leaves that Pete had made. The Cutchin scout who leaned over me was short and squat with long matted hair and teeth worn to a black stub by beetle nut. He took a good look at me and jumped back as if he'd been bitten. Japanese! It's Japanese! I kill! kill. No, no, no! Hold on there. Wait a minute. You... Hold on, I said. <laughs> now listen, Su Ling. Su Ling, this, this is American. Just like I said. It's Japanese. It's no use, please. Listen, Sue, is a Japanese. Yes, yes, that's right. But is American, too. You savvy? American. Friend. Look at his uniform. You say friend. I say Japanese. We'll fix up from fever. Then bring to camp. Let them say which is what. I don't know what he mixed up in those witch doctor concoctions besides the juice of mahogany leaves and the roots of the liana vines. But whatever it was, I was on my feet two days later. We started out for Detachment 101. Only this time we had a guide. And then the next night, out of nowhere, we came upon it. Well, what do you know? Here it was, the OSS secret hideout. 
carved right into the jungle of Burma. So this is Detachment 101. They will need straw thatched bashas. A mess hall, a well-equipped hospital, mortars, bazookas, crates of ammunition. Harry, Harry, look, a woman, a woman, a Red Cross nurse. G.I. paratroopers in bright colored shirts and unlaced jump boots were strolling about, mingling with the native troops. Wow! Oh, this is just like a city in the wilderness, isn't it? It's like nothing I've ever seen before. And probably like nothing you'll ever see again. Huh? Well, well, where'd you come from? Yeah, sure, and I've been standing behind you all the time. Would you like to have me show you around, maybe? Oh, well, not now, thanks. The guy who brought us here disappeared. We've got to find the head man around here. We have something for him. Ah, but you'll live longer if you live slower and don't drive yourselves. My mother, Esther Soul, told me that in Dublin many years ago. Hey, I'm Irish, you know. No, no, you don't say. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> now, take a good look at our little camp. As I said, you'll probably never see anything like it again if you live to be 104. It's as if the leprechaun set it down right in the middle of the wilderness. Well, we'll look around later if you don't mind. Uh, who's in now charge? Now, you take all these lads, the paratroopers who were fast down in the jungle. They all had the same look about them when they first came, as if they'd stumbled into a bed of far-leaf clothes. Now, uh, look, Mac, would you mind very now, much? that lad there was a farmer in Wisconsin. And they went talking to the nurses from Boston, originally, that is. And the tall lad is a Texan. What we want... And it took a lot to make him say that this looked better to him than Texas. <laughs> Were you uh, forced down here, too? Uh, well, uh, in a manner of speaking, uh, yes, I was. What did you do before the war? I, uh, well, I'll tell you, lads. I operated a hot fur ring from Hoboken to Canarsie. You hot what? Fur ring? A right thriving little business it was, too. And after the war, I'll probably go back to it. This guy's off his rocker. Oh, look, where can we find somebody in authority? At evening mass with everyone else. Mass? Of course. You see that big straw hut at the far end? You'll find him there. We went to Mass. And when we got there, we found our friend with the bro. The one who told us he ran a hot fur ring from Hoboken to Canasi, officiating at the service. Every once in a while, he'd look up at us, and I could see the suggestion of a smile around his lips. There was a soldier standing next to us. Hey, hey, who is that? That? Why, that's Father O'Toole. He practically organized the 101. Yeah, sure, and I said it just to see the look on your faces later on. <laughs> well, take a good look. <laughs> Boy, mine's red. Oh, <laughs> but Father O'Toole. Yes. Here are the four Japanese orders the Colonel gave us in India. Of course, the original plan about dropping them over to you and turning back didn't work out, but just as long as we got them here... Just as long as we have them, we know what to do with them. Now, there's a Japanese mail courier coming through tomorrow night from the groom to the Jap camp at Moklum. Now, I'll have Su Ling or one of the other scouts intercept him and uh, deposit this document in his mail pouch. Oh, I get it, Father. When he comes to, he won't know what hit him, but he'll keep going. With the forged papers, eh? Yeah, sure, you got a quick brain, lad. And, uh, by the by... Oh, yes, Father. You know, since you're Japanese as well as American, I'd suggest you stay close to me for the next day or so until you leave. You see, then the natives will get over their suspicions of you. I see. Which one of you men was down with fever? Ah. Uh, uh, oh, I, I was, nurse. I'm sorry for barging into your hut this way, Father O'Toole, but Su Ling told me one of these men had jungle sickness. Wait, that's quite all right, nurse. Amy, lads, take a look at her. Isn't she a fair Kali, no? Oh, that's enough of your blarney, father. Come with me, please. What's your name? Nabura. Lieutenant Harry Nabura. I'm okay now, really. I... That may be so. We just want you at the hospital for a checkup. Come along. Hey, hey, wait. You, uh... <laughs> Do you mind if I come too? No, not at all. <whistles> <whistles> The doc who looked me over gave me a clean bill of health. 
They must have been those witch doctor herbs of Su Ling's. And later, Father O'Toole gave us a bosh to ourselves, and Pete and I fell on those army cots. Oh. And then about three o'clock in the morning... Harry, Harry, what's that? Uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't know. Let's find out. Yeah. Where's, where's everybody running to? Oh, there's that nurse maybe seen her. Hey, nurse, nurse! Nothing to be alarmed about, boy. What happened? One well, of the cab approaches. Our watchdog caught a crawling enemy scout. Well, I didn't hear any dog. Oh, this is a silent watchdog. What? Silent. Actually, it's a crossbow with a 150-pound pull. It's set up so any intruder who touches the trip string is shot with a poisoned arrow. Well, well that, uh, that's quite a watchdog, isn't it? Yes. I've been thinking of putting one up in front of my tent. <clears throat> oh, Su Sally, Su Sally, Father O'Toole. All right now, Su it's Ling all right did not now. mean. And now it's done, Su Ling. It can't be helped. It's all right. Oh, hello, Father. Oh, there you are, lads. Come on in. Oh, what's up, Father? Hey, Su Ling, make a big mistake. Big, big mistake. Oh, what kind of a mistake? Well, I'll tell you, boys. Uh, it's like this. I sent Sue out last night to uh, intercept the Japanese courier and deposit this document in his mail pouch. What went wrong? Well, it seems that Su Ling doesn't know his own strength, to quote a phrase, and he hit him too hard. I'm very much afraid the courier will not be able to deliver the mail after all to the camp at Muklum. Well, look, Father O'Toole, that document is important. It's got to get there. Where's the uh, courier now? In the hospital, receiving the very best of care, I assure you. And the mail sack? In my position. Okay. Then another Jap courier is going to take his place and deliver the mail. Well, you're nuts, Harry. What other Jap courier? Me? What? <laughs> now I know you're nuts. Pete, when I switch uniforms to that guy, take a good look at me. I promise you, you'll never recognize me. The idea has a touch of genius, lad. I think it may work. I hope it may work. Slip in an extra prayer for me, Father. While I was at it, I went after the letters and cards that were going to the Japanese soldiers and phoning them up. I raced everything but the signatures and wrote about how bad conditions were back in Tokyo, how the black market was flourishing, how they were being bombed every night. At dawn, I had changed into the captured courier's uniform. I had the mail sack over my shoulder and Suling at my side to take me most of the way. Good luck again, me boy. Thank you, Father O'Toole. Oh, Harry, Harry, you, you sure that you want to do this? Walking right into the lion's den. If they get wise to you. If they get wise to me, she got a ganai. What's that mean? It's good Japanese for so what? <laughs> I should... A courier from the Brigham with mail for your soldiers and a special dispatch for your commander. Mail courier, come across. Let me see your face. I do not know you. Where's the other runner? The papers. Let me see your papers. Identification. Here. Very good. Pass. This uh, dispatch, you say, is for me. Uh, here, Colonel Nagel. Why are you so late? Mail was expected yesterday. Uh, it it uh, was unavoidable. Answer my question directly. Why are you late? Uh, native, a uh, Kachin warrior attacked me on the way. I had to fight him off, Colonel Nagel. Uh, those Kachins, silent devils in the jungle. Shadows. Impossible to know when they are about. They jump out at you. Devils. Oh, yes, Colonel Nagel. Well, what are you waiting for? You may leave now. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, sir. I'll leave. i leave. I was glad to leave. It would have been easy up to that point. I tried to keep from walking too fast to the gate. Pass. Let me see a pass to read. Uh, here, it was standard Colonel Nagel's headquarters. All right. You can go. Wait! Hey, 
Are you deaf? Did you not hear me shoot off a gun to call your attention? Uh, why you want me? I do not want you. I received the word at gate from Colonel Egeo. He wanted you to come back. Come. <laughs> There you are, courier. I want to make sure you did not leave here. Uh, is there uh, something wrong, uh, Colonel Nagel? What you talking about? What could be wrong? Here, important message for your colonel. Take it. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Colonel Nagel. I should be glad to deliver this to my colonel. This time, nobody stopped me when I left the camp in McLoom and started back for Kutchin headquarters. I must have been within two miles of Detachment 101 when I realized I was being followed. I couldn't see anyone or hear anyone, but I knew someone was there. In the brush or the trees, hidden somewhere along the trail. I started to run faster. My lungs started to ache with each breath. My strength was gone. The hangover from the fever I'd just gotten over. If I had escaped from the Japanese camp and fallen into headhunter hands, I knew I didn't have a chance. Are you talk Japanese? English? What are you? Headhunter? Good luck. Good luck. Ravanadi. Ah, now bless my soul, Lieutenant Nabura. I see you're awake. How are you feeling, Harry? Father or two. Pete, <laughs> what are you doing here? Sit up, Lieutenant. Let me change that bandage on your head. Now, wait a minute. How did you get here? Yeah, did you mixing things up a bit, lad? You mean, of course, how did you get back here to the OSS camp? To the what? Ah, well, now, it is very simple. Oh, I have an apology to make for my friends, the Kutchins, who brought you here. They'd been out scouting for the past week, and they did not know you. Also, of course, the Japanese uniform you were wearing confused them. But I... I... It was a pity that they speak only their own language, so that you couldn't clear up the situation. I have to teach them how to speak English. <laughs> English the way it should be spoken. <laughs> Lieutenants Haruyoshi Nabura and Peter Barno were returned to India by plane from the rescue camp at Assam. And a few weeks later, a special dispatch informed OSS headquarters that the strategic city of Bamo had been taken. Thus, once again, the report of another agent closed with the words... Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak and dagger. Heard in tonight's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Pete was Chuck Webster. Harry was played by Ralph Bell. Father O'Toole by Eric Dressler. Others were John Allison, Raymond Edward Johnson, Carl Weber, Jerry Jarrett, Maurice Tarplin, and Guy Rep. The script for Cloak and Dagger was written by Winifred Wolf and Jack Gordon, and the music was under the direction of John Gart. Sound effects by Wes Conant, Manny Siegel, and Norman Gruenfelder. Tonight's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program was produced by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS. 
ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Black Warfare. Espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. In tonight's episode, Overground Railroad, the part of Lieutenant Fontaine, OSS agent who helped thousands of American airmen escape to safety, is played by Les Tremaine. The story is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. When a flyer was forced down behind enemy lines, he was just another fugitive, moving cautiously at night to avoid detection, fighting for survival. His shelter was a haystack or a hedgerow. For food, he dug raw potatoes or turnips from the field. And in his panic, he was always just one step ahead of the Gestapo, with no knowledge of the country and no friend to whom he could turn. A few of the lucky ones managed to escape back to England. I met one of those lucky ones in Colonel Johnson's office at OSS headquarters in London. Lieutenant Fontaine, this is Major Davidson. How do you do, Major? Glad to know you, Fontaine. Now, before I ask Major Davidson to tell you a story, I want to say something. Yes, Colonel Johnson? At its narrowest, the English Channel is only 20 miles wide. Yet it took Major Davidson here more than a year to get across. And hundreds of Allied pilots all over France haven't been able to make it yet. And if something isn't done to help them, they never will. But, Colonel, with the Nazis occupying France... With the Nazis occupying France, the channel is still only 20 miles wide. Our trouble has been that up to now, we've had no contact with the French underground. No way of helping them smuggle pilots out of France. All right, Major Davidson, go ahead and tell your story now. Well, I was shot down over the south of France, coming back from a bombing mission. The rest of the crew was killed. It was just my co-pilot, Johnny Porter, and me left. Yes. Go on, Major. We figured our numbers were up. Any flyer forced down on enemy territory figures that nowadays, but uh, we were lucky. A farmer picked us up and hit us overnight. And then the next morning, a big black limousine drove up, and a woman about 60 got out. She took us to her house in Paris and kept us there. She found a way to smuggle us across the channel with a fisherman just a few days ago. Who was this woman, Major? Her name is Madame Annette Jobert. I used to tell her she meant more to the Yankee team than Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> During the time we were with her, she managed to collect two more of our boys, but she has no way of getting them out of France. Well, what do you think, Fontaine? Just what you think, Colonel. For the first time, OSS has a lead, a contact. What'd you say this woman's name was, Major? A Jobert, Madame Annette Jobert, and quite a gal, too. Colonel Johnson, with her help, maybe we can set up a chain of um, way stations. Establish a, uh, shall we say, an overland railroad. Collect our flyers and move them like chessmen right across France to the Channel. How soon can you leave? Anytime you say, Colonel Johnson. Anytime. Oh, by the way, Major, how will I be able to identify myself to Madame Jobert? Did you agree on any uh, code word, anything? <laughs> Yes. Here you are. <laughs> A black lace garter. I left London a few days later and landed the next morning on the coast of France. A disguised fishing boat let me off and I made my way to Paris undetected. It was spring, 1944. I was going to know April in Paris but not the way any American tourist before the war had known it. The red dawn was touching the roofs of Paris and the golden dome of the Pantheon. Most of the city was still dreaming of other, better springtimes before the Germans came. And then the city started to wake up. Bakers were at work through the windows, wetting the dough. 
The waiters from the cafes were sweeping into the gutter the cigarette butts that their customers had dropped under the tables the night before. For a few minutes, it was the Paris my mother had talked about. And then, an official Nazi car turned the corner, and I knew that everything had changed. I made my way to 46 Rue Dancy, where I'd find Madame Annette Jobert. Madame Jobert! Madame Jobert! What are you doing making all that racket so early in the morning? People are still trying to sleep here. Well, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm looking for Madame Annette Jobert. This is her house, isn't it? Oui, it is her house. Did you see her go out this morning? Do you think I have nothing better to do than keep an account of her comings and goings? But I... I did not see her go out this morning, and I have not seen her go out any morning for a week. She has moved. Moved? If you take the trouble to look, you'll see the windows are all boarded up. Madame! Madame, please! I've got to locate her. I... I'm her nephew. Ask her good friends, the Germans, where she is. Go to the Gestapo! Now, oh, wait a minute, please! I was up a blind alley. I had come to Paris because I had a contact. Now the contact was gone. Uh, there you are, monsieur. More café. Merci. Uh, you're the first one in my cafe this morning. Oh, I remember other springs. It was always crowded at this time. Uh, what is it, monsieur? Do you not feel well? Something wrong? Oh, no, no. Not, not wrong, exactly. It's just that I came to Paris to see my aunt. It seems she's moved and left no forwarding address. Oh, what a pity. But there is always one way to find her. A way? What is it? You have only to go to the Gestapo and ask. They will tell you. Go to the Gestapo and ask. Sure, why not? OSS wasn't particular who helped us as long as we got the help. I was sure Colonel Johnson wouldn't object to my letting even the Gestapo give us a hand. I beg your pardon, I can't but... just hear him on the phone. Wait a minute. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, ja, Commandant. Ja, augenblicklich. Für augenblicklich, ja, ich werde augenblicklich ein Albot rüber schicken. Jawohl, Herr Commandant, jawohl. Now, what is it? What do you want? Uh, I would like some information. What kind of information? I... I arrived from south of France this morning. I came to visit my aunt. Only I discovered when I got here that she had moved. Well, what do you want us to do about it? Well, I... Merely request her change of address. I felt certain it would be in the records of the Gestapo. No, natürlich is in our records. The address or change of address of anyone in Paris is listed with us. Uh, what's the name of your aunt? Jobert. Madame Annette Jobert, Sergeant. Mm -hmm. yeah, let me see your papers. Oh, yes, see. There you are. Mm -hmm. well, these papers of yours intrigue me. Never seen any like them before. Is uh, something wrong with them? What? No. Yeah, on the contrary, they are filled out extremely accurately. Usually one thing or another is omitted. I congratulate you on your thoroughness. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. Thank you. Uh, Herr Commandant, um, uh, there is a Frenchman at the front desk who is trying to locate his aunt, uh, uh, Madame Annette Robert. Yeah, Commandant. Jawohl, I'll send him in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Uh, wait, wait, one other thing. Uh, your suitcase. What? My suitcase? Uh, no one is allowed past this desk without having his luggage or packages checked. Uh, put your suitcase up here and open it. Suitcase was filled with clothing, but there was a false bottom to it. And in the false bottom was a shortwave radio. If the sergeant accidentally pushed the button that would reveal the radio... What are you so slow about? Here, give me that suitcase. Oh, yeah. Ach, don't know whether that's a schwer. What do you have in it? Rocks? Well, no, 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 it's... Uh, oh, case, I don't know, no, 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 just metal open it. Yeah, yes. There. There, you see? Just personal articles. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I see. <laughs> uh, do you think I expected you to walk into Gestapo headquarters with a time bomb or a shortwave radio in your suitcase, perhaps? <laughs> uh, that's just routine. I must check up everything. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Commandant's office is right down the hall. First door you come to on the right. <laughs> Sit down, sit down, Monsieur Pontin. A cigar? These wine-soaked French cigars are very good. Thank you, Herr Commandant. I never resist a good cigar or a pretty girl. You wonder, perhaps, why I am seeing you personally about this matter of locating your arm, eh? Uh, whatever the reason, Commandant Kurtz, I, I'm flattered. Oh, not at all. Tell your aunt for me that I am delighted to render her this little service. A fine woman, a delightful woman, and a clever woman, too. She's been most cooperative. Oh, I, I'm sure she has. Commandant Kurtz, uh, it is most urgent that I find her. Uh, urgent? How urgent? I, uh, I have news for her about my uncle, uh, her brother, who is very ill in the south of France. Ah, uh, pity. Uh, tell her for me that if she desires to travel, I will arrange for the necessary permit, of course. Well, you're very kind. Not at all, not at all. Uh, now, let me see. Ah, uh, uh, here it is. She is boarded up her house at 46 Rue Danzig, as you know, and moved to another residence 20 kilometers southwest of Pels in the village of Tori Perrault. Here, here. Write out the exact address. Thank you for your help, Herr Commandant. I assure you, uh, I will never forget it. <laughs> I took a train to the village of Turi Ferrot, and all the way I kept thinking about Madame Jobert. The German high command evidently considered her one of the most important collaborationists. We considered her our most important contact with the French underground. She certainly had someone fooled. I hoped it was the Nazis. Madame Jobert is in here, monsieur, in the library. Merci. Monsieur Fontaine, madame. Come in. Come in. Cecile, you may go and close the door. Oui, madame. Come close. No, come closer. Let me have a good look at you. Eh bien, it's quite far enough. Now, what's all this nonsense about being my nephew? What's the matter, Auntie? Don't you recognize me? I've never seen you before in my life. I have regards for you from friends. Friends. Major Norman Davidson and uh, Lieutenant Johnny Porter. I've never heard of them. You don't remember helping to smuggle them across the channel, Auntie? This is insolence. Of what are you accusing me? Of being an important link in the French underground. Nonsense. I know of no underground. If there is one, it does not concern me. Now go back and tell them at Gestapo headquarters that they have made a mistake. And tell Commandant Kurtz I am hurt at his suspicions of me. What makes you think the Gestapo sent me? Only the Gestapo knows my change of address. They were very obliging. They gave it to me. I ask you to leave, monsieur. I am very busy this afternoon. I believe you lost this, Madame Jobert. That black lace garter, where did you get it? It was given to me by Major Davidson, who says you mean more to the Yankee team than Joe DiMaggio. Oh. <laughs> he also told me to give you a great big kiss for him. <laughs> well, bless my heart. <laughs> bless my heart, indeed. You still want me to leave? Uh, you are as fresh as all Americans. Sit down, <laughs> sit down. Thank you. So you just walked in and uh, asked the, the Gestapo. Gestapo. Oh, <laughs> stupid swine. Oh, I'd like to see their faces if they knew. Oh, come, 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 Madame Jobert. Is that a way to talk? They think very highly of you. Which is just what I want them to think. Where are the other two pilots now, madame? I deposited them in a monastery in the south for safety. Mm -hmm. But I have no way to get them to the channel. Look, madame Jobert. Oui? Perhaps you and I can establish a chain of way stations. Safe houses across France. <gasps> then the OSS can collect the hundreds of flyers who are shot down and you can send them back to safety. Yes, but how could I do that without help, without a way to contact England? I have a radio in the suitcase. Oh, oh, oh. 
Very well. In the morning we will drive to the monastery. The monks there are friendly. They would be more than glad, I'm sure, to let us use that as a base to start operations. Oh, great. That's wonderful, Madame Joubert. <laughs> hey, you had a kiss for me from Major Davidson. Where is it? Right here, Auntie. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> and now, young man, you will oblige me by giving me back my garter. <laughs> She was quite a girl, all right, Madame Jobin. She gave me a suite of rooms to myself, got me a chauffeur's uniform, decided my name should be Claude. And in the morning, we set out for the monastery. Yes, yes, Lieutenant Fontaine, hey, Claude, that is just what we will do. Yes. OSS will furnish each member of an air crew with detailed escape maps when they are briefed in England, pinpointing the friendly areas on the route of every mission. Do you think these safe houses will be difficult to set up? Oh, not too difficult, I think. I know already of the home of a sympathetic parish priest, a church, a school, a farmhouse, and I have many wealthy friends who will be willing, I am sure. Why are you slowing down? Nazi guard wants me to stop. Uh, don't worry, I have all the necessary permits. Hi! Let me see your permit to travel. Uh, here you are. This is a great inconvenience. I will report it to my friend, Commandant Kurtz. Commandant Kurtz? Ach, yeah. I, I see you, you have his personal stamp on, on this pass. Where are you headed for, Madame Joubert? I have business in the village. Ah, I, I, I would suggest you, you do not go today. Why not? There is to be an execution in the square. Not very pleasant, madame. Execution? What are you talking about? We found 35 tons of arms and, and materials that were stolen from German supply trains. Found all that? Where? In, in the monastery. The monastery? I cannot believe that. Yeah, but it is true. And today they will be shot. Five of them. I see. Claude, continue. You may go if you like, but it will not be very pleasant. Claude, continue. Oui, madame. They discovered the supplies in the monastery. What about the two American flyers you had hidden there? Did they discover them too? Are they among the five? Quickly, drive quickly, Claude. We reached the square, parked the car and got out. The people were huddled in little whispering groups. At the far end of the square stood the monastery, and lined up at the wall were five monks, their heads lowered, their hands fingering the crosses around their necks. Facing them was a Nazi firing squad. Madame Joubert grabbed my arm. What are we to do? I don't think there's anything we can do. Shh! Let this be a lesson to you people of this village. This is what happens to those who fight against us. These five will be shot. The other monks from the monastery will be sent to Germany. You understand? Take a good look. Learn your lesson well. Ready? Ready? Fire! <laughs> Madame Joubert and I went back to the car. But, Madame Joubert, if you drive back yourself, what will the guard say who stopped us before? I am an excellent liar. I will simply tell him I went to see a sick relative and left you there to help. But... I must drive back immediately. As I told you, I am giving a birthday party for Commandant Courts. I hope he does not live to see his next. Now, you go to the convent. It is only a few kilometers from here. You know what to do. Yes, I know what to do. Madame Joubert, what do you think happened to those two pilots who were hidden in the monastery? They were 
probably found and killed. But Lieutenant Fontaine, we must go on with our plans. Some have been killed, we, but many can be saved. I said goodbye to her. She drove away. The convent of Our Sacred Lady was within walking distance. When I reached the gate, I saw an avenue of acacia trees leading to the great ornate iron door. The center panel formed the figure of the Virgin Mary. It was really spring in these gardens, a peaceful sanctuary in a war-ridden world. What is your wish? I would like to see the Mother Superior. Follow me. I followed the nun through the spacious hall. It was part vestry, part repository of art objects. The walls were hung with darkened old paintings of the Holy Family. In glass chests along the vestry, religious utensils of gold and silver had been stored. This is the office of Mother Angeline. Come. Mm. So you want me to let you use the convent of our sacred lady as a base for your underground operations? Mother Angeline, if you know the risk yourself and refuse, I can't find it in my heart to blame you. But if you agree, I want you to know first just what those risks are. Tell me, my son. I've just come from the village. The monastery there was raided last night. With my own eyes, I saw five of the monks shot. The others were hauled away by the Nazis. Only God knows where. I know about that. I heard this morning. If this convent is used as a hideout and the shortwave radio is hidden here, can you imagine what the Germans would do if they found out? You would expect no better treatment than the monks received. I thank you for telling me this. You are right. It is a great risk. I have many under my care here. They depend on my wisdom to do the right thing. Of course. You have the other sisters to consider. You came here today to convince me of your cause. I'm afraid I must disappoint you. What's that? You see, I... What's the matter? A German armored car. I can see it from the window. Coming here? I'm afraid so. It is the first time we have been raided... I am not looking forward to their muddy boots in this place of God. They'll find me, Mother Angeline. What can I do? Where can I hide? They are at the door. You rang for me, my mère? Yes, Sister Therese. Give my friend one of the sister's robes. One long enough to cover him. And a hood. Oui, my mère. The other sisters... Are they already in the chapel? Oui, my mère. We have started the afternoon adoration. See that my friend joins them in prayer. Then, then open the main door. We have visitors. I put the nun's robes over my suit and went with Sister Teresa to the chapel. I knelt with the others. About 20 benches divided by a middle aisle provided seats for the worshippers. At the far end of the room was a high pulpit. Many of the kneeling prayed with arms stretched out, symbolizing the form of the cross. The sister next to me clasped her hands, and on her ring finger was the silver emblem of a bride of Christ. They prayed almost silently. Hers were the only words I heard. O oh, maternal power of the universe, mother of divine grace, Pray for us, our wisest virgin, our kindly virgin. Pray for us. Pray for the sick world. Good sisters, these soldiers wish to search the chapel. I must bow to their wishes and ask you to file back to your cells. 
Leave now quickly and quietly, please. My head lowered, the hood covering my face. I got into the line with the sisters. I bent my knees slightly so that the robes would cover the chauffeur's boots I was wearing. I lowered my head even more as I passed the SS Hauptmann, who was standing with his men next to the Mother Superior at the door. I regret the necessity of disturbing your prayer, Mother Angeline. When after the unfortunate incident in the monastery last night, I feel it is necessary. You may search this convent from top to bottom, as you are already doing. You will find nothing in this house of God to interest you, I'm sure. Hurry, sisters, hurry, back to your cells. They're really gone, Mother Angeline? Of course, they found nothing here. You can take that robe off now. You look uncomfortable in it. <laughs> Thank you for protecting me. I believe now. But we have not finished our conversation. Mother Angeline, you told me I could not convince you about our cause. You said you'd have to disappoint me. I took that as your answer. Let me consult two of the other sisters first. Wait. Oui, ma mère. Our two sisters, those in the sacristy. Send them here, please, Sister Celeste. A few minutes later... Sister Celeste returned, followed by the two other nuns. Their arms folded and heads lowered, they shuffled into the room. And then, all of a sudden, I noticed broad-toed army boots protruding beneath the long black dresses. One of the heads raised, and I saw that he needed a shave. Mother Angeline, I, I don't understand. Th these men? They are American pilots brought here yesterday when the monks received underground information that the monastery would be raided. Major Kirstein, Captain Lewis, this is Lieutenant Fontaine of the OSS. OSS? Oh, yes, yes, it's great. Have you got a way of getting us out of France, Lieutenant? Yeah. Say, what happened to Madame Jobert? she all right? Uh, yeah, yeah, she's all right. <laughs> Mother Angeline, you, you led me to believe I wouldn't be able to convince you of our cause. Of course not, son. How could you, since I was already convinced? The convent of our sacred lady was the first link in a chain of safe houses that was forged within a couple of months under Madame Jobert's leadership. We moved Major Kirstein and Captain Lewis along that chain until they reached the coast of France. They waited, hidden in a farmer's barn, while I established contact with headquarters in London. Agent Fontaine to OSS headquarters in London. Overground railroad established. Train on the tracks. Passengers ready to leave and waiting. Pick them up and make room for more to come. <laughs> did come. Over 2,000 more airmen who were shot down in occupied France rode the overground railroad established by Lieutenant Claude Fontaine to safety. Thus, once again, the report of another OSS agent closed with the words, Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on Cloak and Dagger. <laughs> Heard in tonight's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Lieutenant Fontaine was Les Tremaine, Madame Jobert, Bryna Rayburn, and Mother Angeline Lily Valenti. The script was written by Winifred Wolf and Jack Gordon. The music was under the direction of John Gart. Sound effects by John Powers and Manny Siegel. Today's OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program was produced by Louis G. Cowan. The National Broadcasting Company extends its heartiest congratulations to Station WBEN, Buffalo. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS. Ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Black Warfare. 
espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Tonight's story, Seeds of Doubt, concerning an OSS agent who tracked down Nazis in American uniforms, is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. I'm glad I wasn't there when Celeste got my message. If I had been, I might have called the whole deal off. Found some other way to carry out my mission. What I did was pretty brutal. I know just how it must have been. I gave the note to the baker's delivery boy, Henri. He must have driven the dilapidated old truck through those majestic iron gates of the Chateau Breton, 12 miles south of Paris. Circled the huge house and come to a stop at the servants' entrance. And perhaps it was Muriel herself, Celeste's personal maid, who answered the door. Pour mademoiselle. Merci, monsieur. Pour vous, monsieur. Hmm? <laughs> Merci, madame. And then Muriel began that long climb up to Celeste's roof. Three flights of marble stairs and then down the carpeted corridor to the fourth door on the right-hand side. Mademoiselle? Entrez. Entrez, Muriel. Celeste was probably reading. She always was in those days. It was a way of passing time while she waited for some word from my friend, Paul Blanchard. A message, mademoiselle. A message? From who, Muriel? I do not know. It was all so mysterious. A baker's truck was at the door, and the boy no, gave... No, no, never mind. Give it to me. Voila, mademoiselle. Oh, that I'm writing. Mademoiselle, it is not... Not from... No, 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 no. Oh, mon Dieu. But then... Then it is... It is, uh, it is Paul. Oh, my Paul he is here in Paris. He is waiting for me in the cafe in Montparnasse. Oh, le bon Dieu. I was afraid he was dead. That's how it must have been. And all the while I sat in a dingy little room in the back of the Café de Trois Shaw, drinking cognac, feeling like a dog, waiting. I waited about an hour and then... Paul! Oh, Paul! Oh, Mademoiselle Breton? Oh, you are not Paul? No. Where is he? Uh, Mademoiselle, I was a friend of Paul Blanchard. But where is he? Where is Paul? Uh, Mademoiselle... Uh... Answer me. Very well. Paul is dead. Like I say, it was brutal. But is there any way of saying it that isn't brutal? She tottered toward the table and then slumped into a chair. Dead. Her face was deathly white. And yet it was still the loveliest face I'd ever seen. But this note, it is Paul's handwriting. Well, a forgery, mademoiselle. The OSS is well equipped to forge any man's handwriting. The OSS? Oh, I begin to understand. You are a... Lieutenant Martin Ingalls, morale office, OSS. And you deliberately told... That's right. I had to see you, but I... I couldn't come to the chateau. And I knew you wouldn't ignore a note like that. I see. I will aid you for this, Lieutenant. As long as I... That'll be rather awkward, considering our future relationship. We shall have no future relationship. You and I. I think we will. I've come to Paris to take Paul's place. Take his place? Yes, as your fiancé. At first, that is. And then, later... As your husband. She sat down again, slowly, and listened in stony silence as I told her how I'd met her fiancé in North Africa. I told her how he'd described me, and then how he described their swift, frenzied courtship in Geneva just before Paul joined the Free French Forces. Then I told her how he died. Paul... 
loved France. Yes. And he told me once that you loved her, too. And that's why I'm sure you won't refuse to make your own sacrifice for her. And that is what, monsieur? Allowing me to pose as Paul. Letting everyone think I'm the man you met in Switzerland. How do you know you could pose as Paul? That someone would, might not recognize you. The OSS has made sure that we'll be perfectly safe. You see, Paul's father was a government official in Madagascar for 20 years before the war. Paul visited France only once, and that was the age of eight. And from that age until he met you in Switzerland, he hadn't set foot in Europe. So you see, no one would know the difference. I would know it. Of course. That would be your sacrifice. And how would France benefit by my suffering? I couldn't blame her for putting it like that, but I wasn't exactly flattered. I tried to explain my mission. D-Day was six months behind us and most of France had been liberated. But now there was Bastogne, the Battle of the Bulge, von Rundstedt's big offensive. And black warfare is a game two can play. Morale, or the lack of it, can help decide a war. The OSS knew that. And so did the Nazis. And that's why there are German agents floating around Paris, doing their best to plant seeds of doubt and, and to destroy allied morale. Nazis here in Paris? But how is it they are not caught? Well, that's my job. It's not going to be easy because most of them are in GI uniforms. Uh, impossible. Why? We send agents behind German lines. They send them behind ours. Black warfare was Hitler's first great weapon. Why do you think Poland, the low countries, yes, even France collapsed so fast in 1940? Because the Nazis had agents behind the lines. Fifth columnists doing the same thing then that they're doing now. But that was in 1940. The war isn't over yet, mademoiselle. Far from it. And the longer these Nazi agents operate in Paris, the longer the war is going to last. <laughs> now that's why it's important that the OSS smoke them out and fast. But I... I do not see why... why it should be necessary for you to... To become your husband? But because then I'd be the master of Chateau Breton. So, so. And what could be more natural for a wealthy Frenchman and his wife out of, out of gratitude to the Americans than, than to throw open their home to lonely G.I.s in Paris? Oh, you mean... Parties, you... mademoiselle. Cocktail parties, dinners, dances, whatever might attract the G.I.s. And the German Asians, n'est-ce pas? Right. It's at affairs like that that they do their work. They, they spread rumors and lies, stir up dissension. And it wouldn't take me long to spot them. It is a very clever scheme, Lieutenant. There is only one thing wrong with it. I do not care to be your wife. It would be a strictly impersonal arrangement. And just as soon as my job is done... No. It is out of the question. Very well, mademoiselle. I'm sorry Paul was wrong. Wrong? About you. That was another dirty trick, playing on her memory of Paul, her love for him. But it worked. In a half hour, we were engaged. Do you, Celeste Breton, take this man to be your lawful wedded husband? I do. And do you, Paul Blanchard, take this woman to be your Not lawful one of the Paris wife? blue bloods who crowded into the church suspected that the headquarters colonel wasn't really a minister. And I guess I was the only one who wished he were. After the ceremony, Celeste and I drove out to the chateau and settled down to <laughs> housekeeping. Yes? Who is he? Your husband. Well, what is it you want, Lieutenant? Well, I just got back from the USO. I announced our first open house for Saturday. Looks like we're going to have quite a mob. We should be ready for them. You don't mind my stepping in? We can talk about it. But uh, we just did talk about it. No? <laughs> yeah, I... Uh, yes, I, I guess we did. 
Then good night, Lieutenant. And that was married life at the Chateau Breton. It's a good thing our series of parties did start then. Took my mind off <laughs> other things. It looked like every Joe in the European theater attended those parties. The champagne flowed, the canapes vanished. Each clam bake was a bigger success than the one before it. Except I didn't spot any Nazi agents. Yes, there were plenty of rumors, sure. That's one thing an army always has plenty of. I tell ya, I, I hear we're getting our brains beat out at Beston. This man's war ain't over yet, pal. The guy was telling me the other day how the brass snafu thinks it can't break. Like a guy was saying the other day, if uh, Hitler wants to negotiate, well, let's negotiate and get it over with so we can go home. I heard Hitler's got a secret weapon. Bacteriological stuff. He's just waiting for the right time to use it. If I'd arrested every guy I heard repeating a rumor, I'd have had half the G.I.s in Paris in the clink. The guy I was looking for was a guy who did all the talking the other day. I knew he was one of the guys lounging in the living room or sprawled on the patio or loafing in the gardens. Yes, but which one? For several days, I didn't get anywhere. And then I noticed Corporal Alan Chester. Corporal Chester, how are you? I might never have paid any attention to him if he hadn't paid so much attention to Celeste. Every time I looked up, they had their heads together, and Celeste was smiling. And the time I found them sitting on a bench in the garden, she was actually laughing. <laughs> oh, hello, Paul. Well, if it was a good story, you're going to have to tell it again, Corporal. Uh, it was a very good story. Uh, you have met my husband, haven't you, Alan? Uh, this is Corporal Chester, Paul. We've met so many times, it's getting embarrassing. <laughs> I've already apologized to your wife, monsieur, for wearing out my welcome. No apologies necessary. My only excuse is I can't stay away. Your chateau's the first place I've felt at ease since I left home. Where is home, Corporal? In Lafayette, Indiana. Lafayette? Well, an American town with a great French name. That's right. <laughs> Maybe that's why I feel like I found a second home right here, 20 kilometers from Paris. It wasn't much to go on. Just a word that didn't ring quite true. I took Celeste aside and asked her about it. Alan Chester? You think he might be... Oh, you are a fool, Lieutenant. Maybe. But I still want to know why he said kilometers. In Indiana, they say miles. Perhaps if I told you, he was a Harvard graduate. They say miles at Harvard, too. Only Europeans say kilometers. Yes, sir. And because of that, you suspect him of being a Nazi agent. <laughs> Absurd. He is the most charming of all the men who have come here. I noticed you thought so. Did you, Lieutenant? Then maybe uh, that is the reason you suspect him. I admitted she might have something there. I admitted it to myself, that is. Not... An hour later, a jeep with four G.I.s in it rolled through the gates of the chateau, and one of the G.I.s was Corporal Alan Chester. And 30 seconds later, I was behind the wheel of Celeste's little jaguar, following the jeep. Dusk was falling, and the road to Paris was lined with traffic, and it wasn't too hard to keep a few cars behind the jeep, seeing without being seen. In town, the jeep pulled up in front of a cafe on the Boulevard Saint Germain, and Corporal Chester climbed out and waved goodbye to the other three. <laughs> Luckily, it was a gloomy joint. He walked straight across the dance floor. I hugged the walls and moved in the same direction. He didn't stop at the bar. He, he didn't sit down at a table. He headed straight for a back door. He opened it, and he went out. I gave him ten seconds. Then I went out the back door, too. It was an alley. 
and as dark as only a Paris alley can be. So dark, I thought there was only one guy leaning against the building. Pardon, monsieur. Est-ce que vous avez un cigarette? I dug into my pocket for a cigarette. That's when I knew that there were two guys. I whirled around. The second one was standing behind me, and there was something in his hand that looked like a blackjack. My fist shot out quick and connected. But number one was on me then with a hole that I hurt. I, I broke away, and I let him have it. And that's when I found out what it was the other man held that looked like a blackjack. It was a blackjack. I hit the cobblestone. For a moment... I saw number two standing over me and heard a girl singing far away. Then I didn't see or hear anything more for a long time. <laughs> It was dawn when I climbed up to the third floor of the chateau. If Celeste was sleeping, she woke up plenty fast. And if she had to get into that shimmery house coat she wore, she must have done it in record time. Lieutenant! My Dieu, you look terrible! I didn't tell her that she looked wonderful. I didn't ask her if I could come in either. I just walked past her and I sat down on the van. I told her what had happened in the alley off the Boulevard Saint Germain. But all the time I talked, I was thinking of something else. That we were alone. But she was very beautiful. Uh, and so now, of course, we are quite certain that Corporal Chester is a German agent. Well, that's how it adds up, doesn't it? Perhaps I am not so good at figures. These men may have been thieves. They took your money, n'est-ce pas? Well, that doesn't prove anything. Well, that could have been a cover-up. But why would Corporal Chester have wanted you uh, be beaten up? Well, it stopped me from tailing him. Now, that cafe may be a regular hangout, and Miss boys may hang around outside to take care of any shadows who show up. Oh. Then you think he did not know you were following him tonight, huh? Well, his boys may have reported that they slugged a guy in the alley, but well, they can't be sure who I was or well, even that I was tailing him. I see. <laughs> I look that funny? No, no. I am just thinking what a fool you are, Lieutenant. Strange. I was thinking the same thing myself. What do you mean? A man who has a wife as lovely as you doesn't even kiss her. He is a fool, isn't he? He would be even more of a fool if he tried. Have you forgotten that bargain? A strictly impersonal relationship, you said. I said it when you said you'd be loyal to Paul Blanchard's memory. Then am I not being loyal? I don't know. But the way you smile at Alan Chester wouldn't suggest you are. Oh, you do not like the way I smile at him, huh? I don't like it at all. Uh, then, naturally, you would not wish me to accept this invitation. What invitation? That is why I call you a fool, Lieutenant. You think Alan hires men to keep anyone from finding out where he is staying. Why, then, is he so careless with me? Why does he invite me to his room? Why, that... Oh, of course, if I went, I could tell you where he is staying. Perhaps I could tell you a great deal more. If he's a Nazi agent, I would surely find it out. Oh, but you do not want me to go. You're to go whether I want it or not. Oh, how noble you are, Lieutenant. <laughs> So she kept her date with Corporal Allen Chester, and I paced the rooms of the chateau and waited for her and suffered. It was dawn when she got back. Well, let's have the report. The uh, personal one, Lieutenant, or the impersonal one? The impersonal one is the only one that concerns me. Maybe. Well, I found out nothing, and I am more certain than ever that there is nothing to find out. Okay. Thank you. Well, maybe you'll try again some other night. Tomorrow night. It is all arranged. I see. 
end. I will give you the personal report too, Lieutenant, even though it does not concern you. I had a lovely time. <laughs> It was the next night when I began to suspect her. I suppose I started even before she came home. I tried to look at things straight, and I asked myself if I were being taken for a ride. She walked in an hour later. You are wasting precious time, Lieutenant. I still think Alan is just what he says he is, an American soldier on detached service in Paris. I have seen his orders. Well, orders can be fake. Ah, oh, c'est ça. Then, if you are still suspicious, I will keep another date with him. Tomorrow night. I decided there'd better be three of us on that date. She told me the name of his hotel, an old and honorable one, in the Rue de Vaux, Girard. I slipped into its musty lobby early the next morning. An old man with bushy brows and a faintly familiar face eyed me as I approached the desk. I told him I was Paul Blanchard, the master of Chateau Breton. If you say you are Paul Blanchard, monsieur, then you are Paul Blanchard. Any reason to suppose I'm not? Me no, monsieur. None at all. Just as there was no reason during the resistance to suppose that you were an OSS agent. <laughs> He'd been in the Marquis unit I'd worked with on a mission before D-Day. He was Pierre Salon, a patriot. It was a break, and I knew that I was safe. Safe enough to tell him as much as necessary. It shall be done, Lieutenant. This Corporal Chester is in room 613. Room 612 will be vacant all evening. Here's the key to it, Lieutenant. The door between the two rooms will be unlocked. And fortunately... The walls are paper thin. Five minutes after Celeste had left that night, I was on the road to Paris. At the hotel, I went straight to room 612, let myself in. It was empty. Pitch black. There was no sound from 613. Celeste and Corporal Chester had probably gone to a cafe first. It might be a long way. It was a long wait, and a hot one. The windows were closed, the room was stuffy. I stood there in the blackness, and the sweat poured down my face, and the minutes ticked by. Then, at last, the door to 613 opened. I pressed my ear against the wall. Oh, at last. Pierre was right about that wall. It was paper thin. I thought we'd never get up here, darling, where I could kiss you. I've been wanting to kiss you all evening. The sweat was rolling down my face harder than ever. I don't see how I'm ever going to be able to leave you, Celeste. This is really our last meeting. I'm leaving Paris tomorrow morning. It is very hard to think. Alain. Yeah? If I were not married, if Paul were not really my husband. What's the use of saying it? He is your husband. But what if I tell you he is not? What if I confess it is all a sham and mockery? <clears throat> I wasn't sweating anymore. Now I was so cold, I shivered. I don't understand, Celeste. You mean he's only pretending to be your husband? Marie, only pretending. But why? In order to trap you. He is an American, an officer in the U.S. He thinks you are an association. The butt of my revolver was cold, too. My hand squeezed tight around it. Is this true, Celeste? He actually thinks I'm a German? Yes. And I think so, too. I know you are. Celeste. But I don't care. I would not have told you my secret if I did. I love you. And how long would you go on loving me if I were an enemy of France? What is France to me? What is any country to any woman? I will love you no matter what you are. All right, Celeste. You're right. I'm a member of the intelligence service of the Third Reich. I twisted the knob, jerked open the door, and stepped into room 613. Lieutenant. Thank you for selling me out, mademoiselle. If you weren't a traitor, I might never have been sure about Corporal Chester. With a lamp on the table, the only light in the room, and it stood behind him. As I spoke, a swift movement of his arm sent it crashing to the floor. Now there was darkness again enveloping all three of us. We all moved. We 
changed our position swiftly, silently. None of us could speak without tipping off where we were. Neither Chester nor I could fire for fear of missing. So we circled the room. And we waited for our eyes to go accustomed to the dark. And then, he must have thought he saw me. He missed me. The bullet struck something near the door. But the flash of his gun was all I needed. I fired. And then on the third shot... It wasn't until old Pierre Chalon opened the door and light from the hall flooded the room that I saw what the late Corporal Chester's bullet had hit. It was taken Celeste for me. She lay dead where she had dropped. Ah, uh, c'est dommage, Lieutenant. C'est dommage. In this war, even the innocent must die. The innocent? <laughs> he was a traitor, Pierre. No, 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 Lieutenant. She no. deserved to die just as much as that rat over there. But if that is so, then... I should not have told her, Lieutenant. I am sorry. You told her what? She passed by the desk. I thought she was working with you. You, you, you did not Yes, mention. yes, but what did you say to her? I said, all is well, mademoiselle. What? The lieutenant has arrived. He is in room 612. Good Lord. Then she knew all the time. Then the only possible reason why she would have told him who I was 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 to persuade him to confess who he was. She'd have been crazy to say what she did otherwise, knowing that I was listening. Then she did not betray you. No, Pierre. No, she didn't betray me. Perhaps it was you she loved then, Lieutenant. No, Pierre. It was France she loved. <laughs> The rest was easy. In Corporal Chester's room, he found a list of names in code. We broke the code before dawn the next morning. And by that night, we had every Nazi agent in GI uniform corralled. And once again, the report of another OSS agent closes with the words... Mission accomplished. Listen again next week to another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak... And dagger. Heard in tonight's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Lieutenant Ingalls was Chuck Webster, Celeste, Alice Frost, Corporal Alan Chester, Joseph Julian. Others were Carl Weber, Evelyn Juster, Jerry Jarrett, Louis Soren, Horace Bram, and Anna Karen. The script was written by Ken Field, and music was under the direction of John Gart. Sound effects by Manny Siegel and John Powers. Engineering by Don Abbott. Tonight's OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program was produced by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Warfare, espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's adventure, Operation Sellout, is the story of an American OSS agent who went into German-occupied France to locate Nazi submarine bases and is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told.
I knew something was up when Colonel Palmer met Tom Barnes and me at the dock that night. He hadn't come down from London just to wish us bon voyage. There wasn't time for such formalities in the OSS, even when a couple of its agents were embarking for the coast of Nazi-occupied France. The minute the jeep pulled to a stop, the colonel stepped into the faint glow of the blackout light. Captain Dagger? Yes, sir. This is the radio operator, Captain? That's right, sir. I'm Barnes, sir. Lance Corporal Barnes, Sussex Guards. You men are all set? Yes, sir. You shove off in 20 minutes. That'll put you ashore below Saint-Nazaire just before dawn. After you've been landed, you'll move inland exactly six kilometers. You'll be met there by an agent of the Marquis. You understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, men. We've got a lecture then, Tom you and I. We didn't need it. Understand how we knew our mission was important. This mission is terribly important. German submarines had been hitting our convoys in the Atlantic. Hitting them hard. Shipping losses had to be cut. And the best way to cut them was to blast the Nazi sub-pens along the French coast. You understand? It was my job to locate the biggest pens. It was Tom's job to radio the information back to England. So the Allied Air Forces would know where to lay their eggs. Now then... No, we didn't need any lecture on how important it was. Daggett. <laughs> You're not listening. Oh, I'm sorry, Colonel. I, uh, I heard it all in London two days ago, sir. I uh, was wondering why you came down here to say it again. I may have had another reason for coming down. Well, that's what we figure, sir. There's been a change in plans? Slight one, yes. Originally, you two were the one to take this mission alone. I've decided now to uh, send a third man with you. Oh, who is he, sir? I'd rather say nothing about it till you see him. He'll be something of a surprise to you, perhaps. A surprise, sir? Yes, though not too unpleasant a one, I hope. Your reaction to him may well determine the success of your mission. I, uh, afraid I don't understand, Colonel. You will in a minute. He's already on the boat. Come along. Tom and I followed the Colonel out on the dock. A British Navy torpedo boat that was going to take us across the channel lay in the water. A black shadow in the black night. We climbed aboard, stowed our gear on deck, and moved toward the forward cabin. Tom and I exchanged looks. Neither of us liked this uh, slight change in plans. Your new man is in here, Captain. Well, let's have a look at him, Colonel. For a moment, the bright lights of the cabin spilling out on the deck blinded me. Then I saw him. First, I thought it was a gag, until the guy turned. Until he made a stiff bow from the waist. Until he said, Good evening, gentlemen. I'm Lieutenant Karl Müller of the German Reichswehr. Then I knew it wasn't a gag. He belonged in that uniform he was wearing. It was all his, every Nazi stitch of it, right up to the death's head insignia on his left shoulder. Herr Miller, this is Captain Link Dagger. And this is Corporal Barnes of the British Army on detached service with the OSS. It is a pleasure to meet you, gentlemen. Is it? Well, Palmer, may, uh... May Barnes and I speak to you alone? All right, Dagan. I will go out on deck. Well, Dagan? Well, do we have to say it, sir? You must know how we feel about this. I'll say it, Link. Sir, I don't like the idea of taking a jerry with us into Nazi territory. Well, do we have to do it, Colonel? You volunteered for this mission, Barnes. You don't have to do anything. Yes, but Dagan and I can do the job, sir, without a jerry. You can do it faster with him, Corporal. And we've got to start hitting those sub pens as quickly as possible. Miller will be valuable to you in obtaining information from his former fellow officers. Must have a lot of faith in this Nazi, sir. He's not a Nazi. He's a German. Is there a difference, sir? Yes. Even when he was an officer in one of Hitler's pet divisions, Colonel? Through no choice of his own, Daggett. Miller was captured by the British in North Africa two years ago. He's been working as an interpreter for the OSS for 18 months. He's been thoroughly screened. We have faith in his story that he's always been opposed to Hitler. Well, he, he could have been lying to you, sir, just waiting for a chance like this, a, a chance to get back to German territory. He could have been, but we don't think he was. Yeah, but if he were, sir, Barnes and I are a couple of dead ducks. He'll sell us out the minute we get across the channel. That's quite true, Daggett. And that's the chance you'll both have to take. <laughs> Well, we could have backed out, but we didn't. You never do. 
So we headed across the channel. One Englishman, one American, and one German. I don't know what the German was thinking. He didn't say much. But the Englishman and the American were thinking it was going to be a one-way trip. Just before dawn, the torpedo boat put us ashore below San Nazaire. We stood listening to her motors die away. And I turned and walked up to Lieutenant Carl Mueller. I lifted his Luger out of its holster and he didn't say a word. I broke the gun open. There were 12 rounds in the clip and one shell in the chamber. I dropped the clip in my pocket and handed the gun back to him. The shell's still in it. Danke, Herr Kapitän. Mueller, I left you one shell. If anything goes wrong, you may need it. That is, if you're on the level. I will use it on myself rather than fall into the hands of the Nazis. Yeah, I know you will. If you're on the level. If you're not, though, you'll think twice about using it on us. You see, you, uh, you couldn't get both of us with one shell. You understand? Yeah, I understand, Herr Kapitän. It was just a phony gesture, of course. He knew as well as I did that it didn't mean a thing. The country was occupied by a half million of his countrymen. He could wipe us out like, like stepping on a bug. If he wanted to. Dawn was breaking when we left the beach. We started inland to keep our rendezvous with Philippe Martin, the Maquis agent who was to set us up with a base of operations. He must have made quite a picture. Two men dressed as French peasants trudging along behind a Nazi officer. We kept to the fields and moved along hedgerows as much as we could. Then we came to a highway. A German army lorry rumbled by while we squatted behind the hedgerow and held our breath. <sighs> Looks all clear, darling. Yeah. Yeah, we'll cross one at a time. You first, Mueller. Yeah, Herr yeah, Kapitän. He got over the hedgerow and out onto the highway. It was halfway across. Tom and I straightened up to follow him, and we saw it. We dropped down again. A German reconnaissance car swinging around the bend in the road. It stopped a few feet from Mueller. He looked at the Nazis. They looked at him. We looked at both of them through the hedgerow and waited. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! It was in the lift of his voice. It was in the smile on his face. There was no mistaking it. Karl Mueller was back with his buddies. Karl Mueller was home. Dink. Let's get away from her. Make a run for it along the hedgerow. For what? If he tips off those crowds, we won't get ten feet. Yes, I, I guess you're right. Well, if we go, I'm taking Jerry with us. I'd had the same idea. I'd already sneaked my revolver out of my coat. We drew a bead on that stiff Prussian back and we did some all waiting crouching and waiting until... Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! All right, Herr Kapitän. It is safe for you to come out now. We went out, but not before we'd exchanged another whisper. Not before Barnes said what we were both thinking. Maybe the colonel was right, Link. Maybe the jet is on the square. Or maybe he's just smarter than we thought. What do you mean? Smart enough to use us for bait. That was it, bait. Why get rid of us so fast? We weren't that important. He could get rid of us whenever he wanted to. And he'd only want to after we'd served his purpose. After we'd jeopardized the French Marquis by exposing them to him. Yes. And after we'd sent a lot of Yankee and British flyers to their death. We joined Mueller and continued on to our rendezvous point. There was nothing I could do about it. Mueller had been assigned as a member of the mission. So far, he'd acted like one. Don't knock off a fellow agent, unless you're sure. 
All right, Link. We're just six kilometers east of the beach now. Yeah. Yeah, this patch of woods must be the place. Um, what do we do now, Herr Kapitän? Nothing. Just wait. Wait for what, monsieur? He'd stepped out from behind a bush as silently as a shadow. But shadows don't carry Tommy guns. You were uh, expecting someone, monsieur? Yeah. A man named Philippe Martin. I am Philippe Martin. Well, then you know who we are. No, I'm afraid not, monsieur. If there were two of you, I would know. But not three. There was a last-minute change of plans. A very great change, since it made room for a Nazi officer. Look, not all men who wear Nazi uniforms are Nazi officers. True, monsieur. But all Frenchmen know a Nazi when they see one in or out of uniform. Why is this man here? That Tommy gun was shoving into Mueller's chest. I had to talk fast. I explained who the German was. I, I said the OSS trusted him. The OSS may trust him, monsieur, but I trust no German. That makes no difference. My orders are that Mueller's a member of this mission. Now let's get going. You hear me, Martin? Very well, monsieur. Follow me. Where are you taking us? To my farm. You will set up your radio in my barn. Is it safe? Safe? Why don't you ask your friend, Herr Müller? Two hours later, Tom had his transmitter set up in the loft of Philippe Martin's farm, a few miles outside Saint Nazaire. With your permission, Herr Capitaine, I will leave now. Yeah. You know what you're to do, Mueller? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with these forged orders Colonel Palmer gave me, I will be able to secure all the necessary information about submarine pens in the Saint Nazaire area. If you want to. I hope, Herr Kapitän, I will be able to prove to you that I do want to. We hope so, too, Mueller. All right, get going. We expect you to contact us daily. We don't hear from you. Link, someone's at the door. Who could that be, Philippe? 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 It is all right, monsieur. It is my sister, Marie. She is also a loyal member of the Marquis. Marie Martin wasn't just a loyal Marquis member. She was a beautiful one, too. I wouldn't have had a look at her to know it. I'd only have had a look at the at Tom Barnes as her brother introduced her. This is my sister Marie, monsieur. Marie, Captain Daggett, Corporal Barnes, and... and Herr Lieutenant. Herr Lieutenant? A germ? Here? Lieutenant Mueller is a prisoner of war, mademoiselle, working for the OSS. He is a Nazi. An ex-Nazi, mademoiselle. The only ex-Nazis are dead ones. Philippe, throw this pig out of here. Now, wait a minute, mademoiselle. Your brother and I have had all this out. Philippe has agreed to... He has no right to agree. This is as much my farm as it is his. I will not have a Nazi on it. All right, all right. In as much as Mueller's just leaving for Saint Nazaire on a mission... You are sending him on a mission? You must be out of your mind, Capitan. I, um... I think... Your brother and I have had all this out. Philippe has agreed to... He has no right to agree. This is as much my farm as it is his. I will not have a Nazi on it. All right, all right. In as much as Mueller's just leaving for Saint Nazaire on a mission... You are sending him on a mission? You must be out of your mind, Capitan. I, um... I think she has a point, Link. You remember that little discussion we had back on the highway about bait? Yeah, I remember it, Tom. And I'm pretty sure now that we were right. We have no more proof now than we did then. I would rather he would stay here, Capitan, than see him go on a mission. Well, uh, Herr Capitan? Get going, Mueller. Blink, you're making... Shut up, Tom! You will hear from me, Herr Capitan. We, oui, you will hear from him. Through the Gestapo. I wasn't sure she was wrong. And Tom Barnes was sure she was right. But then Tom's judgment wasn't to be trusted. Not where Marie Martin was concerned. Well, Tom, where you been? Oh, I, um... I took a walk with Marie down by the brook. 
Hmm. You uh, you take a lot of walks with Marie, don't you? Oh, why not? There's nothing to do but cool our heels until we hear from Mueller. And quite frankly, old man, I can't think of anybody I'd rather cool my heels with. And then we heard from Mueller. We heard quite a lot from him, and not through the Gestapo either. You must copy these maps immediately, Herr Kapitän. I must get them back to the Nazi headquarters before morning. You will find on them the location of the Nazi sub-pens from San Nazaire to Dunkirk. I copied the maps and deciphered the code symbols. Turned my report over to Tom to transmit to England. But Tom was stubborn. How do you know those maps weren't fake, Link? I don't. Maybe Mueller's using us just the way we thought he would. Well, maybe he is. Then why on earth send that stuff out? Because those are my orders and I'm going to obey them. I'll send it, Tom. We'll see what happens. Well, we saw what happened. That night off in the distance, a thousand searchlights stabbed the sky. There were black puffs of smoke everywhere. The crowds were throwing up a curtain of flak that no air force in the whole world could penetrate. Next day, Mueller came back to the barn. By then, Tom had received the box score from England. Twenty planes! You hear that, Mueller? We lost twenty planes last night. I... I do not understand, Herr Corporal. Oh, no, no, you don't understand it at all, do you? They knew we were coming, they were waiting for us. But you don't understand it. You are implying, of course, that I betrayed you. But I give you my word. His word, the word of a Nazi. Marie, please. Bien, Capitaine Daggett. Are you perhaps convinced now? I told you we should have listened to her, Link. Easy, Tom. It is too late, of course, to save those 20 planes. It is not too late to stop other raids. As of course, he's right, Link. I'll radio Colonel Palmer this minute. Yeah, Capitaine. Well, Mueller, I, uh, I have another map, if you wish to look at it. All right, let's see it. I, uh, I would prefer to show it to you alone. Alone? Why, you pig of a German! Oh, filthy scum! Are you suggesting there's anyone here but yourself who can't be trusted? Look, Mueller, you're in no position to make such a request. You have something to show me? You can show it to me here. <sighs> Very well, Herr Kapitän. He had something to show me, all right. A detailed chart of the biggest sub-pens along the whole coast. I knew it was worth any risk to try to smash those pens. But Tom Barnes didn't know it. He needed a lot of convincing. He insisted that chart was bait. Just bait. It turned out he was right. The next week was a nightmare. <laughs> Eight planes at Austin, six at Cherbourg, nine at Le Havre. Everywhere we struck, the crowds were waiting. Operation Sellout, Tom and I called it. We had a name for Lieutenant Mueller, too. Tom wasn't around the night I reached a decision. I went looking for him. Down by the brook, of course. It was a bright moon. I saw two figures as I approached. Then the two figures became one for a moment. I, I love you, Marie. Oh, mon cher Don, you must not say it. In France today, there is no place for the word love. Maybe not, my darling. But when the war is over, I'm going to ask you to marry me. Tom. Oh, oh. Link, what are you doing here? Get back to the barn. Why don't you radio Palmer to call off the raids? At last, you have come to your senses, Capitan. What about Mueller, Link? Well, forget Mueller. It's almost a week since we heard from him. We don't even know where he is. But we can guess, no, Capitan? He is in Berlin, probably, receiving a medal from his Führer. Tom and I had to work fast. Once it dawned on the Germans that there'd be no more raids, they'd be after us. We radioed the colonel, canceling the raids, telling him we thought our mission was over. Six hours later came the answer. The colonel thought otherwise. Good Lord. We can't be serious, Link. Yeah, he's serious, all right. He still wants to smash those subpens at Sanders Air. Since they couldn't do it from the air, they're going to do it from the ground with a commando raid. <laughs> Yeah, 
commando raid. A hit and run attack where coordination and split second timing were everything. Tom and I were to be the inside men. Big job, yeah. But this time we didn't have two strikes against us. No, because this was one clam bake that Carl Mueller wouldn't know anything about. What do we do first, Link? Contact the local leader of the, the Maquis. We'll let him know what's happening and he'll give us a safer place to roost. But how do we contact him? Well, Philippe will know him. Oh, Philippe's in Rouen. Wait a minute. Hmm? How about Marie? She might know, too. Right. Go get her. He went to find Marie. I packed up the radio and the other equipment. I heard the door open. I thought he brought her back. I was wrong. Good evening, Herr Kapitän. Mueller. I didn't expect you to show your face around here again. I heard in Sarasaire that the raids have been cancelled. I was afraid you and Corporal Barnes might be on your way back to England. We're packing now. Oh. I, uh, I am not to go back with you then. There's only one place you're going, Mueller. So, uh, put your gun away, Herr Capitaine. You do not need to kill me. Since you are leaving me here, I shall make use of the one shell you so kindly left in my revolver. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you will. You couldn't bear to be left behind with your Nazi pals, could you? They weren't from my gun, those shots. I didn't know where they were from. I didn't wait to find out. I hit the floor, dragging the candle off the table with me. The barn went black. I lay there for a second. And then from outside, I heard... This has some light, Link. I think I got him. Tom had fired the shots. When I'd lit the candle again, I saw he was wrong. The doorway where Mueller had been standing was empty. Mueller was gone. I... I was sure I hit him, Link. All right, never mind. We've got something more important to think about than Mueller. You told Marie. Oui, Capitaine, he told me. You wish to see the local Marquis leader? That's right. Can you take us to him? Mais oui, Capitaine. I will arrange for you to meet Monsieur Etienne. She said it would take until the next evening to arrange it. Tom and I cleared out of the farm and holed up in the patch of woods where we'd first met Philippe. Of course, it had to start raining. Just before dark, Marie showed up in the woods. It is done, Capitan. Monsieur Etienne will be waiting for you at eight o'clock. They're on behind the village cafe. Good work, Marie. Well, you're going there with us, aren't you, darling? No, mon cher. I must return to Monsieur Etienne. But I will be waiting for you at the cafe. <laughs> She was standing in the doorway when we got there at eight. She led us around the back into a small, dirty, dimly lit room. Bonsoir, monsieur. He rose from his chair and stood behind the table. Monsieur Etienne was a small, dark man. His eyes were shifty and calculating. The kind of eyes you often find in a head that has a price on it. My apologies, monsieur, for not seeing you sooner. I was at my headquarters in the hills. I had to walk down. The roads were wet and muddy. No apologies necessary, monsieur. Merci. Mademoiselle Martin informs me you wish the assistance of the Marquis. We need plenty of assistance. British commandos are planning a raid on the port of Saint-Nazaire. A commando raid on Saint-Nazaire. Those eyes of his grew wider. They grew bright. He stepped from behind the table. But he shouldn't have. Because that was when I saw his boots. They were clean and polished. There wasn't a speck of mud on them. And yet he'd walk through the mud from his headquarters in the hills. He said... Is, uh, is something the matter, Captain? He knew something was the matter, all right. He knew what it was, too. He saw my eyes on his boots and he understood. His hand went under his coat, but it never came out because that was all I needed. <laughs> Link, for the love of heaven! One shot did it. He grabbed at his stomach and he slumped to the floor. Good Lord, Link, what's the idea? He's dead! Yeah, that's one collaborator less. Collaborator? Sure, that's all he was, Tom. Nazis planted him here to find out about our new mission. Yes, but they didn't know we had a new mission. You said Mueller thought we were packing up to go back to England. That's right, he did. Well, then who could have... have... I started to tell him, but I didn't have to. He saw it for himself. Marie... The look on her face confirmed it. The look on his face is the kind of thing you don't like to remember. That was all she needed. She bolted for the door and threw it open. I took one wild shot at her. I missed. Before I could fire again, she was gone. She knows about the raid, Link. We've got to stop her before she gets to the Germans. There's no telling which way she went, Tom. We'll split up. 
You go that way and I'll... Good Lord. The ceiling. It was Marie. Come on. We ran down the dark alley behind the cafe. At the end of it, we found her. Lying face down in the mud. She's dead, Link. Yeah. But... But who shot her? I did, Herr Corporal. Mueller! I'm so sorry, Herr Barnes. I know how you felt about her. But she was our enemy. She had to die. Yeah, but... but how did you know, Mueller? Uh, I finally found a Frenchman who trusted me, Herr Capitaine. His name is Monsieur Etienne. You mean that was his name? You see, he thought that I was a Nazi, too. He confided in me. I... I say Mueller. Yeah, Herr Corporal? Look here, I... I ought to tell you. What I mean is, I, I don't know how to say it. I, I'm sorry, I didn't then, trust... Do not say it, please. I... I understand. Uh, Herr Kapitän. Yes, Mueller... I have used that one shell you left in my revolver. I... <laughs> well, I wonder if you would permit me to have one more. No, I won't. Uh, uh, no? Not one more, Carl. I'm giving you back the whole clip. <laughs> That same night, we contacted the real leader of the Maquis. Two weeks later, the commando struck it in his air. They wiped out that subpen. When they went back to England, Tom Barnes and I went with them. And so did our friend, Carl Mueller. And once again, the report of another OSS agent closes with the words... Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak and Dagger. Paired in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Captain Daggett was Carl Eastman, Tom Barnes, Ian Martin, Carl Mueller, Louis Van Ruten, Marie, Louise Erickson, Etienne, Raymond Edward Johnson, Martin, Arnold Moss, and the Nazi Carl Weber. The script was written by Ken Field and music was under the direction of John Garth. Sound effects by Manny Siegel and John Powers. Engineering, Don Abbott. Today's OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program is produced by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war of agents of the OSS. Ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Warfare, espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's adventure, The Last Mission, the story of an American OSS agent in Canton, China, is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. He must have had another name, but I never knew what it was. And everybody on the waterfront called him Charlie. He was old and he limped and he should have drunk less and shaved more. We'd see him on the wharves in the afternoons in his dirty dungarees and torn sweater, begging cigarettes from sailors. Then evenings he would hobble into Lee Chen's tavern where I worked to beg for something else. Hey, Tanya! 
Hey, ain't you gonna buy Charlie one little drink, eh? No, I'm not, Charlie. No drinks on the house tonight. Oh, but tonight's the night there ought to be drinks in the house. Are you forgetting it was just five years ago tonight Canton fell to the Japanese? <laughs> we gotta celebrate, don't we? <laughs> What's the matter? I, I say something wrong. I don't like your sense of humor. Oh, I, I don't see what you got again, the Japs, Tanya. With all them nationalities mixed up in you, you probably got some Jap blood yourself. No, no, I haven't. Every other kind may be Spanish and Russian, even Irish, but there's not a drop of Jap blood in the Bonillas. All right, all right, all right. Don't get steamed up. I still say there's no reason for you to hate them. What do you care who's running Canton? I told him then. I don't know why I did. I've never told anyone else how they'd murdered my family in Nanking six years before. My father, my mother, my two sisters. The Japs had killed them all. And if we hadn't got out of the city ahead of them, they'd have killed my brother Florian and myself. So, uh, so you wasn't always a waitress in a waterfront dive, huh, Tanya? No. And my brother didn't always prowl the streets looking for trouble. I got the Japs to thank for that. Now maybe you can understand. Easy, Tanya. We got visitors. What do they want now? Uh, checking identification papers again. You will press a rise. Always a rise in the presence of the soldiers. Remember that hereafter. No. Your papers, Pris. Here. Tanya Bonilla. Born in Madrid. You are Spanish, but you have Russian first name. And an Irish middle name. What does that make me? Perhaps makes you anyway Aryan, Captain. Yes, Lieutenant. It would be uh, very dull in Canton if we put all the beautiful girls in jail. That is true. Your papers are in order, Miss Bonilla. I know. Your papers, Pris. Who, me? Huh? I ain't got no papers, Captain. What you done with them? Oh, I don't know. I guess you must have lost them. What is your nationality? I don't know that neither. Nobody never told me. Seems like I've been around Canton since it was knee high to You a are an American, perhaps? <laughs> American? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Take him away, Rutherford. Yeah, no, no, wait a minute, Come. fella. Hold Come. your horses, Touch. will you? I ain't gonna do you guys no good locked up in the brig. But uh, I could help you plenty if I was free to, to mosey around the dock. You come now. Oh, I wait, Rutherford. What do you mean, old man? How could that help us? Why, uh, I get around, Captain. Old Charlie talks to everybody and everybody talks to me. And they ain't too careful what they say, neither. <laughs> if anybody was planning any monkey business, sabotage, or anything like that, old Charlie would be just about the first to know about it. And you would report it to us? <laughs> Why not? You're the guys who are running the show, so you're the guys I take orders from. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> They saw what he meant. And when they left, he was still sitting with me, grinning as if he were proud of what he had done. I got up without a word and went to the bar and bought a drink. I brought it back and held it out. Say, did you buy that for me, Tanya? Yes, I bought it for you. Well, now, that's mighty nice of you. Let me have it. I'll let you have it. There! Hey, what's the idea of throwing good whiskey in my face? What's the idea of that? I couldn't find words to tell you what I think of you, Charlie. But I wanted you to know. I was sorry afterward. After all, Charlie was old and hungry and half-cracked. I should have saved it for somebody else. Someone closer and dearer to me. I should have saved it for my brother, Florian, who was waiting for me when I got home. I thought you'd never get here, Tanya. Hurry up and change your clothes. We're going to a party. A party? What party, Florian? 
Well, it's sort of an anniversary banquet. You know, five years in Canton. There are going to be a lot of important people there. Chinese, Japanese, both. Big celebration. Oh, uh, and we're going to celebrate with them? Oh, we, we weren't invited, of course, but I, I know a fellow at the door, he's going to let us in. We rub shoulders with some of the most important people in Canton. Maybe even with the men who murdered your mother and father. What? Oh, nah, don't, don't be like that, Tanya. That was a long time ago. These aren't the same fellows who took Nanking. And they're Japanese. Yeah, yeah, We're but... not going to the party, Florian. We got nothing to celebrate. No? Well, maybe you are not going, but I am. Why? Because I know what side my bread is buttered on, that's why. The Jap side? As long as they're top dog, yes. And it looked like they're going to be top dog for a long time. I see. You're a traitor to our family, Florian. We haven't got family, Tanya. We haven't got anything. And we never will have unless one of us starts playing on the winning team. See you later. I didn't sleep well that night. I lay there in the dark, feeling as if I were alone in, in a world of enemies. That same feeling haunted me all the next day at Lee Chen's. Charlie didn't come to the tavern that evening. I didn't see him till I was through working, till I stepped out into the dark street. Then a shadowy figure came staggering up to me. <laughs> Oh, oh, you're drunk, Charlie. You better go home. That's just what I was thinking, Tony. Boy, I can't seem to get her. The street keeps going round in circles. How about you kind of steer old Charlie along? I'm sorry. I want to get home myself. It's late. Oh, come on, Tony. Be a sport, will you? Help old Charlie. <laughs> He grabbed my arm and hung on to it. It seemed easier to do what he asked than to argue about it. Right, good girl. Good girl. I had never seen his home, but he remembered the address, and I led him toward it through the deserted streets. Ah, here we are. It was the kind of place you'd expect Charlie to live in. A filthy two-story dump in the worst part of Canton. He was still holding my arm as I took his key and unlocked his door for him. Good night, Charlie. Go to bed and sleep it off. Oh, come on in for a while. Why don't you... No, good night, Charlie. I got a bottle in there, Johnny. We can have a little bit. I don't want to drink. Oh, come on in anyway. Come on, Charlie. Charlie, let go of me. Let go, you hear? But he didn't let go. His fingers were like a vice around my wrist. He jerked me across the threshold. He shoved me into the pitch black room and slammed the door. Now, where's that lion? You filthy old bum! Let me out of here! Sorry I had to manhandle you like that. It was the only safe way of getting you in here. I thought someone else had said it. I, I thought there must be three of us in the room. Then the light flashed down and there were just two. Just Charlie and me. Surprise, Tanya. I'm sorry, but I have to play it safe. You see, Tanya, I am an American. An agent of the OSS. I didn't speak. I stared at him and tried to understand. Tried to... Connect him with the shuffling little wharf rat I'd always known as Charlie. You realize, of course, Tanya, that this is something of a, an act of faith, exposing my identity to you like this. No one else in Canton knows who I am. I thought a long time before I decided to let you in on it. When you told me about your family, I had a hunch I could trust you. And then when you threw that drink in my face, I was sure of it. But Charlie... I mean... <laughs> That's right, I'm still Charlie. Yeah, but... Why have you done this? Why should you trust me with your life? For a very good reason. Because I need your help. My help? You see, I've operated alone here for a long time. Oh, it hasn't been too tough, but now... Now? Jap intelligence is tightening up. A lot of things I can't do alone anymore. That's why I need you. Oh, but, but I have no experience. I, I don't know anything about... You have about... courage and you hate the Japanese. That's worth a lot more than experience. 
What do you want me to do, Charlie? Come on upstairs. He led me up a long, narrow, rickety staircase. He opened the door to a tiny, guard-like room just beneath the roof. It was hot and stuffy. The light he switched on was so dim that at first I couldn't see. Do you know what this is, Tanya? A radio transmitter. That's right. You send messages. To whom? American submarines operating off the Chinese coast. And what I send is all the information I can get about Jap shipping entering and leaving the port of Canton. I see. Tanya, you wait on sailors at Lee Chan's all day. You drink with them. I've never drunk with a Japanese sailor. But you could. Sailors talk a lot when they're drunk. And if they don't talk enough, I could provide you with knockout drops. They'd sleep peacefully while you examined their papers. I, I see. It scares you a little? A little, yes. You see, I... Watch it, Tanya. What? That letter on the wall, you almost touched it. Oh. You better not. Oh, what is it, Charlie? Oh, it's a little precaution I've taken. I wouldn't want this transmitter to fall into Japanese hands. They could do a great deal of damage with it. But the lever in the wall... That can do a great deal of damage, too. It sets off an explosive that would blow this building sky high. I wasn't sorry to leave that room. We went downstairs a few minutes later. He stood in front of me, watching me. Tanya, let me explain something. We're all volunteers in the OSS, and the people who help us are volunteers, too. You don't have to do this unless you want to. I understand, Charlie. If you refuse, I won't worry about what you know. I'll still trust you. I don't intend to refuse. It doesn't scare you too much? When I think of my father and mother and sister, it, it doesn't scare me at all. It's a deal? It's a deal. I, um, I don't have any liquor. We might have a smoke on it, though. American cigarettes. Oh, I haven't had one for years. Keep the pack. Thanks. To a free world, Tanya. To a free world. <laughs> That night I slept well. Now I had friends and allies. That is, I slept well until sometime shortly before dawn. And then the sound of my bedroom door opening awoke me. I wasn't frightened. I knew who it was and what he wanted. It had happened so many times before. I waited until he reached my dresser, until he bent over my purse... Don't no. take any of my money, Florian. Oh, oh, you're awake. Well, I was just... Yes, I know, but I really can't spare any this week. I need the little I got. Well, you don't need it any more than I do. I'm broke, Tanya. Now, where am I supposed to get money to live on? Not out of my purse. Please close it, Florian. All right, all right. But I don't see... Hey, what's this? What? Where you get these? What, Florian? These American cigarettes. I... I got them at the tavern. Who from? From a... a Jap soldier. A Jap soldier? Yeah, he, he had taken them off an American prisoner of war. And a Jap gave them to you? Yes, huh? why not? And you accepted them? Naturally, I accepted them. Well. So now my noble sister is accepting gifts from the enemy. Either you had a great change of heart on you, or else... Or else what? Or else, you are lying. Beginning the very next night, I, I flirted with every Jap sailor who came into Lee Chains. I kept my mouth closed and my ears open. I used every trick I knew to persuade them to talk. And when it became necessary, I used something else. The little white pills that Charlie had given me. 
I don't know. No more to drink. No. <laughs> oh, but the uh, evening no. is young, dog. Come on, come on, let's drink it. Toast to the emperor. Uh, stand up. I can't stand up. Of course you can. Here, I'll help you. Come on. Come on. Oh, no, hey, no. that's it. Now, to the son of heaven, his imperial majesty, drink. <laughs> It was so easy, Charlie. He was out cold. I just reached into his pocket and there were his papers. No one saw you? Not a soul. You put the papers back? Of course. After I'd copied them. Here's the information. <laughs> How am I doing, Charlie? I knew I was doing well. And as time went on, I did even better. We would hear reports on Charlie's radio of Jap ships torpedoed and sunk in Chinese waters. And Charlie would say, That was the baby you told me about last week. <laughs> Chalk up another one for Tanya, the scourge of the Jap merchant marine. I was proud. And I was happy. And I believed my father and mother and sisters knew and that they were proud too. And then came the night I went straight from Lee Chen's tavern to Charlie's house to tell him what I'd heard. The Takoda Maru, huh? That's one of the Nip's biggest ships. I know, Charlie. And she's carrying industrial machinery to Yokohama. One of those factories they've stripped in Fuchao. You sure about the sailing time? Quite sure. Tomorrow night at 10 o'clock. Good enough. I'll tip off the subs right away and they'll be laying for her. If she isn't traveling in convoy. She isn't, Charlie. Then they'll get her like a sitting duck. Well, it's late, Tanya. Better get going. I'll see you tomorrow, Charlie. Not during the day. I'm going down to Tungho's junk on the river. I'll be back here by evening. Oh, good night, Charlie. Wait a minute. Let me see if the coast is clear. Okay. Go ahead. Good night. It was late. The streets were dark and deserted. I would have taken a rickshaw home, but it was too late for that. So I walked. Or rather, I tried to walk, but it was hard to keep myself from running. I told myself I was a fool to be afraid. The streets were safer than in broad daylight. There was no one on them. There was no one who could possibly... I stopped. I thought I heard footsteps. Someone walking behind me. I turned... There was no one there. At least I couldn't see anyone. I started walking faster, and I grabbed the revolver that Charlie had given me. And then I heard the sound again. This time I stopped and whirled around. There was a street lamp behind me, and I saw a shadow on the wall of the building. The shadow of a man. Who's there? Come out and show me who you are. If you don't, I'll shoot. Take it easy, Tanya. Oh, Florian. You wouldn't want to shoot your own brother, would you? Florian, what are you doing here? Where were you following me? Oh, just curious, that's all. I've been wondering for quite a while what you were up to. For quite a while? I've seen you go to that place several times. I even took the trouble to find out who lives there. It's that old fellow they call Charlie. Yeah, yeah that's right. Charlie does live there. He, he's sick. Oh, he's sick. Huh? Yes. Just, uh, just an errand of mercy, huh? Exactly, an errand of mercy. You act as if you didn't believe me. Of course I'd believe you. I certainly don't think you're in love with the old boy. And what other reason would you have to visit him? We walked the rest of the way home together. I was sure he didn't believe me, but I couldn't go back to Charlie's to warn him, not without getting Florian more suspicious. In the morning, I thought. But then I remembered that Charlie would be on Tong Ho's junk on the river in the morning. Li Chen's tavern opened at noon the next day. The minute I walked in, I knew something was wrong. There were too many Japanese soldiers, far too many. 
They sat at the bar drinking. They played cards at the tables. They lounged against the walls, puffing their cigarettes and eyeing me as I crossed the room and whispered to Li Chen. Why are there so many of them, Li Chen? Maybe your brother can't tell you, Tanya. My brother? He in back room, he say you come back see him. I knew then that I was sick with anger and shame. I was sicker still when I saw him sitting alone in that back room, when I saw the smirking triumph on his face. Good morning, Tanya. How's your sick friend this morning? <laughs> don't, don't stand there and stare. I haven't done anything so terrible after all. One spy, more or less. How much did they pay you, Florian? Quite a bit. It seems they've known for a long time there was one operating in Canton. They haven't been able to get their hands on him. Until you betrayed him. Yes, yes. Though they still haven't found him. There's some soldiers waiting for him over at his place where, where you went last night, I mean. And there's a crowd of them here. They're bound to pick him up pretty soon. Didn't you get a bonus for betraying me too? Oh, I might have, but I wouldn't sell out my own sister. I, I kept you in the clear. I told him you helped me spot him. Thank you, Florian. Oh, not at all, Tanya. By the way, I can pay you back some of the money I lifted from your purse. A after all, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be sitting pretty now. With, with, with a couple of hundred yen, even the score? Huh? What do you say? There was so much I could have said, but I didn't waste the time. Only one thing mattered now. Charlie was still free. I swore by the memory of my mother and father that I would keep him free. It was a half hour before I managed to slip away from Li Chen's unnoticed. Charlie had introduced me to Tong Ho, and I had been aboard his junk the week before, so the guerrillas on guard around the boat recognized me. They led me to a cabin. That's you, Tong Ho? It's Tanya, Charlie. Tanya? I thought you were Tong Ho. He just wanted sure to meet a courier from Hong Kong, some sort of important news. <laughs> Not as important as the news I have for you. <laughs> I poured it all out, and he listened thoughtfully. Well, they found the transmitter, of course, but that's no good to them. Couldn't they use it to send false messages? Not without the code book. The subs would know the messages were phony. They'd figure out what had happened. But where is the code book? <laughs> right here. Oh, Charlie. Then there's no reason why you can't escape. No, none that I can see. My usefulness in Canton is over. Yeah, we'll pull out, both of us. You'll take me with you? Sure. Tung Ho will take us up river to... Oh, here he is now. I hope that courier's report was better than the news Tanya brought me, Tong Ho. It was about captive American flyers, what? Charlie. What about them? Fifty of them have been brought into Canton. They're being sent to prison camps in Japan. They sailed tonight aboard the Dakota Maru. The Dakota Maru? Charlie, that's the ship I told you about last night. Yeah. It's the ship I radioed the subs to torpedo. They will torpedo our own men then, Charlie. They will if I don't countermand the order. Gotta let them know the flyers are aboard. They gotta let that ship go through. You cannot tell them, Charlie. You cannot get to the transmitter. I have to. But there are Japanese soldiers there waiting for you. So I'll get past them somehow. Charlie, no, don't go back there. They'll kill you if you do. And they'll kill those flyers if I don't. There are 50 of them. There's only one of me. <laughs> I said I would go back with him. I said he would need help getting past the Japs. I said I wouldn't leave Canton without him. And in the end, because I left him no choice, he allowed me to stay at his side. He told me his plans before we left the boat. they will be waiting for me in the room downstairs, but we won't go that way. There's a trap door in the ceiling of the radio room. If we can get into the building next door and out onto the roof, we'll be able to jump over onto my building. We may get in and send the message without even letting them know we're there. A half hour later, we were creeping up the stairs of the building next door. And a few minutes later, we stood huddled on the edge of the adjoining roof. All right, let's jump. Try to land as quietly as you can. And then, flat on our stomachs, we crawled toward the trap door and pried open its rusty hinges and lowered ourselves into the radio room. <coughs> Charlie sat down at the transmitter, his code book in his hand. 
I went to the door, my revolver in mine. Have you made contact with them, Charlie? Not yet. Any sounds from downstairs? No, not yet. Charlie, hurry. I'm doing the best I can. Yes, but if you... Charlie. Yes? Listen. Someone coming upstairs. Two of them, at least. Maybe three. Okay. Get going, Tanya. No. Quick, out through the trap door and over the roof. Those are orders. But you, Charlie... I'll be right behind you. I've made contact now. All I have to do is finish the message. Now get out of here. It was a lie. It was the only lie that Charlie ever told me. I then crossed the roof. I looked behind me, and he wasn't there. I went down the stairs next door and out onto the street, and he still wasn't there. I moved quickly through the crowd, still looking back, still waiting, still hoping, and then... He had pulled the lever that destroyed the transmitter. Later, a long time later, I learned that the Dakota Maru had passed safely through the submarines with 50 American flyers aboard. Charlie had sent his message in time. He had performed his last service for the OSS. The last one, I mean. The very last had been to die for it. And once again, the report of another OSS agent closes with the words, Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak and Dagger. Heard in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Charlie was Ian Martin, Tanya Bryna Rayburn, Florian Arnold Moss. Others were Ralph Bell, Raymond Edward Johnson, Carl Weber, and Guy Rep. Script was written by Ken Field and music was under the direction of John Garth. Sound effects by Max Russell and Frank Walker. Engineering, Don Abbott. Today's OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program is produced by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing that you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war of agents of the OSS. Ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. <laughs> Warfare, espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's adventure... Delay en route. The story of an American OSS agent who found himself between two fires in fascist-held Italy is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. That was a big night in Sturza. We liberated the town that morning and everybody was drunk. But not on vino. Those Italian partisans were drunk on something they hadn't tasted since Mussolini's black shirts marched on Rome. Freedom. There were only three fascist officials left in town and all of them were down in the village square hanging from a scaffold. I should have been celebrating too. After all, that was why the OSS had sent me into Italy. To help Guido Gordoni and his partisans wipe out fascists. But sitting there in the tavern that night with Rosa, Guido's sister, my mind was several thousand miles away. 
So, Roberto, you are going to leave us tomorrow. Huh? Oh, what, Rosa? The PT boat comes for you tomorrow night, no? The night after tomorrow night, Rosa. Just 48 hours. It's going to pick me up below Savona. Oh, and you are glad? <laughs> Was there ever a guy who wasn't glad to go home? Home? To America, you mean? But how can that be? The war is not over. I've got a furlough coming up. A delay en route to my next OSS assignment. Oh, I see. <laughs> it is nice in America, eh, Roberto? Yeah. Yeah, it's nice, Rosa. It'll be autumn when I get back to Vermont. The trees will just be turning. I would like to see Vermont. Hmm. Maybe you will someday. Oh, you know what I mean, Roberto. I would like to see it with you. Oh. Sorry, Rosa. Guido! Here's your brother. Oh, yes. Guido! Guido, over here! Ah, Rosa. Roberto. Guido. More vino, wait. Well, where have you been, Guido? Looking for a fat fascist pig. Alberto Pelizzo. Pelizzo, the big shipyard owner? Why would he be in Sturza? He's got a summer villa just above the town. I thought he might be hiding out there. I took some of the boys up, but the place was empty. I gotta find him tonight. Why tonight? Roberto, didn't you notice? There's still room for one more on the scaffold in the square. Huh? Oh, that's right, I forgot. You haven't been to the square, have you, Roberto? No, I haven't. You uh, don't like executions. Huh? Executions are all right. It's lynchings I don't like. Those men were civilians, Guido. They were fascisti. Nevertheless, they were entitled to a trial. A trial? If they had caught you, Roberto, would they have given you a trial? That was the difference between Guido Gordoni and me. He and his partisans fought fire with fire. They'd never heard of the democratic process, but I had, and I believed in it. That was why Guido and I could fight side by side and respect each other as soldiers and yet never become friends. You've not lived under the fascisti, Roberto. You've not had a wife and child murdered, as I have. Were the men you hung in the square responsible for that? Every black shirt is responsible. The men in the square, Alberto Pelizzo, all of them. When Guido Gordoni finds them, they pay for their crimes. They should pay, of course, but... But, 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 what, what? What, Roberto? I don't like men who say yes, but... I don't think they can be trusted. Guido, you have no right to say that to Roberto. Forget it, Rosa. I'm leaving all of you soon. You won't have to trust me much longer. I got up then and pushed my way through the crowd to the door of the tavern. I stepped outside. The night was beautiful. But not as beautiful, I thought, as an autumn night in Vermont. Senor I... Huh? She touched my arm as she said it. She'd been standing very close to me in the shadows of the tavern wall. I'd never seen her before, but she was lovely. You are, Senor Mercer, no? Yes, I am. I wish to talk to you, Senor. Will you be kind enough to come with me? I didn't say no. It would have been hard to say no under any circumstances. Besides, her quick, frightened eyes told me it was something important. Still, I kept my hand closed around my revolver as she led me down several dark, deserted streets. This is the house, senor. You will please go down the steps to the basement. Oh, uh, you go first. There is someone inside, but please come in. Do not be alarmed. I'm not alarmed. Go ahead. Buonasera, senor. The man who rose to greet me wasn't armed, and he looked too old and too tired to be dangerous. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Alberto Pelizzo. Pelizzo? 
young lady who brought you here is my daughter, Maria. It was good of you to come with her, senor. But it wasn't very wise of her to bring me. Why? Because you might turn us over to the partisans? Because I will turn you over to the partisans. I think not, senor. No? On the contrary, you will be careful to protect us from the partisans. You will take us out of Italy alive. You will see to it that we arrive safe and sound in America. What makes you think so? Is your government informed, Senor Mercer, of our recent experiments with radio-guided aerial torpedoes? I don't know. I could inform them. These experiments are being conducted in my own laboratories. I know more about them than any other man in Italy. I see. Also, a new type of submarine capable of great underwater speed. All right. Also, the long-sought electromagnetic pistol for torpedoes. All right. Also All right. I get the point, Polizzo. I thought you would. You'll turn over this information to Allied intelligence if I get you safely out of Italy. Precisely. Well, Signor? I'll have to think about it. Don't to think too long, Signor. And don't discuss it with your parties and comrades. I'm quite sure that bloodthirsty Guido Gordoni would not let my usefulness to the Allies prevent him from uh, hanging me. He was right about that. Not that Guido Gordoni was bloodthirsty. He was simply an angry and bitter man. Nothing in the world would prevent him from hanging Alberto Polizzo. Well, I was pretty bitter myself as I headed back to my room above the tavern. I didn't like keeping secrets from Guido. And I didn't like helping fascists. But I knew already what I had to do. I knew that when I went aboard that PT boat in 48 hours, Polizzo and his daughter would be with me. The OSS would want it that way. Hello, Roberto. Rosa. You were gone a long time, Roberto. What are you doing in my room? Waiting for you. I, uh... I went for a walk. Yes, I know. I saw you. What do you mean, you saw me? I was watching from the window when you walked away from the tavern. Who is she, Roberto? That's none of your business, Rosa. I will make it my business. Is she the one who is going with you to America? Is that why you cannot take me? Is it with her that you will spend the autumn nights in Vermont? Rosa, you're a fool. No. You are a fool, Roberto. You cannot conceal her from me. I will find her before tomorrow night, and when I do... Yes? When you do? Life is very cheap in Sturza these days, Roberto. She meant it. She didn't make idle threats. She was like her brother that way. It took me a long time to fall asleep after she was gone. Getting Alberto Polizzo and his daughter safely out of Italy was beginning to look complicated. The next morning, it looked even more complicated. Rosa told me what you did last night, Roberto. It was very stupid to go alone with the strange woman. <laughs> but she was a beautiful woman, Guido. Mm -hmm. She might have led you into a trap. You know, there is still fascisti in Sturza. No important ones, I'm sure. The mayor, the magistrate, and the prefect of police are all hanging in the square. Who else could there be? Alberto Pelizzo. What makes you think? You said his villa was empty. It was. But I don't believe he had time to escape. I think he's hiding out somewhere in town. And I'm going to search every house room by room until I find him. And then you'll string him up too? Oh, oh with pleasure. He might make a valuable prisoner of war. He's a big wheel in the munitions and shipping industries. He'd have a lot of information that would be useful to the Allies. And who would trust the information of a fascist? Not you, apparently. You're right, not me. His information will not save him. If I find him, Roberto, I'll kill him. And that settled that. There was no question from then on of letting Guido in on my plans. Not if I hoped to save Polizzo's neck. And I had to save it now. The information that Guido scoffed at could shorten the war by weeks, months, even years. Ten minutes later, I was knocking at the cellar door. It was opened immediately but not by Polizzo or his daughter. 
Si, senor. Who are you? Dominic, senor. The owner of this building. There was a man and his daughter here last night. They are still here. Come in, senor. Ah, good morning, senor. We have been waiting for you. We expected you somewhat earlier than this. Oh, so sorry. I'll try not to disappoint you after this. You are ready, I presume, to take us out of Italy? I'd much prefer to turn you over to my friends. Oh, of course. But unfortunately, your preference is not what matters. Unfortunately. When do we leave, Signor? You leave Sturza tonight, Italy, tomorrow night. Signor, we are grateful. We knew you would not fail us. I'm not doing this for you. Naturally. We understand that, don't we, Maria? Yes, Father. Still, we will reward Signor Mercer, no? You in your way, and I in mine. Let's cut the talk, shall we? You've got to get out of here. Get out now, you mean? But you said tonight. You can't stay in this cellar till then. You'll have to find a new place to hide. Why, Signor? Because the partisans are looking for you. They're covering Sturza house by house. No, they do not know where we are. They think you might be. They're not taking any chances on letting you escape. They want to string you up where you belong. Where can we go, Signor? How can we hide? I don't know yet. I thought maybe the. Open up in there! It is there. Right. We are trapped in here. Unless there's another way out. If there is no other way, Signor. Please, Signor, please, you must do something. Shut up. Don't let me. Shut up. Dominic. What's that iron trap door on the wall? The coal chute, senor. Open it. Yeah, it looks just big enough. Where does it lead? To the rear of the house. What all right, all right, let's get going. You first, Maria. You want me to climb that filthy coal chute? What about my clothes? What about your neck? She scrambled up the chute and Polizzo followed her. I went last. <laughs> I didn't see what happened to Dominic, the landlord, and I didn't much care. Where now, senor? You've got to lie low someplace where they won't find you before tonight. But there is no such place. The best bet's your villa. The villa? They've already looked there. They won't go back. Those thieves and murderers have sacked our beautiful villa. They're neither thieves nor murderers. They're loyal patriots. We have our name for them, senor. You have yours. And while we're together, we'll use mine. Now beat it. <laughs> I arranged to meet them at the villa at dusk. I watched them trudge off, smeared with coal from the chute, looking like the peasants they despised. (laughs) At least there wasn't much chance they'd be recognized. But I wasn't exactly recognizable either, so I washed off in a little stream at the edge of town. Then I went back to my room. Where have you been, Roberto? It was Guido. He was sitting at the table in the center of the room. And lying in front of him was his revolver. Where have you been, Roberto? Out. Out? Where? Just out. Oh, just out, huh? All right, Rico. Bring him in. Inside you. Move. Here is a friend of yours, Roberto. He appeared in the doorway, prodded by Rico's carbine. He was no friend, only an acquaintance, a very recent acquaintance. He was the landlord, Dominic. You were hiding a man in the cellar of your house, Dominic? See. Si. Well, who was he? Who was he? Uh, Alberto Pelizzo. Alberto Pelizzo, huh? And he had a caller this morning? Si. Who was the caller? That man, Signor Mercer. All right, take out the old man, Rico. Please. Oh, you... Roberto? Well? I want Pelizzo. You can't have him. Where is he? I won't tell you. You are protecting a fascist then? I'm doing more than protecting him. I'm taking him out of Italy. To America. To America? Why? Why? So he can have a a fair trial? No, so he can turn over information. Information? Yes. You've seen this information? It's not on paper. It's in his head. And you believe him? Yes. And you believe he's going to give it up once he's got to America? It's worth the chance. How much? What? How much is it worth, Roberto, to you? Why, you... The whole $50,000? $50,000? That's how much he's got sewn in the lining of his overcoat, his landlord told me. I didn't know it. You're lying, Roberto. Pelizzo is paying you well. And I shall have to deal with you as I would with any other traitor. 
I give you one more chance, Roberto. Where is that fascist? His hand moved for his revolver on the table, but my hand moved too. My fingers caught the edge of the table and it flipped it. Oh! Crawling back in his chair, the gun clattered to the floor and I kicked it out of his reach. What's dirty, filthy, I do it. Do, do. My fist caught him on the point of the chin. His head snapped back and he slumped to the floor. Out. I didn't like to do that, Guido. Sorry. You should be sorry, Roberto. Rosa. Maybe you will tell me where the fascist is, Roberto. I'm not telling anyone, Rosa. Then I will do what my brother did not have the chance to do. I don't think you will. Don't come near me, Roberto. If you try to get this gun, I swear I'll kill you. But you won't, you know, because you don't believe I'm a traitor. You are. And even you if are. I were, you wouldn't shoot me because you love me. No, not anymore. I hate you. Then why don't you pull the trigger? <laughs> Give me the gun, Rosa. Take it. Take it and go. I went down to the street. The car that Guido had commandeered for his use in Sturzo was parked in front of the tavern. I went over to the driver. Antonio, Guido wants you. He is upstairs, Signor Mercer? Yes, in my room. Hurry. Step in, Signor. I'm the at Polizzo's villa 20 minutes later. Maria met me at the door. The way she was dressed, you'd have thought she was sailing for America on the Queen Mary. Signor Merso, how nice that you have come early. Where's your father? In the library. This way. We were not expecting you until tonight. My plans have changed. Polizzo. Ah, Signor Merso. You have arrived just in time. In time? For what? Maria and I have opened one last bottle of wine for Marcel. We shall be happy to have you share it with us. No, thanks. Maria, another glass. I said no, oh, thanks. Come now, my dear fellow. Here, Father. <laughs> we will drink to you, Signor, our benefactor. And then we will drink to the new world where we are going. A world where these differences between us can be forgotten. A world where we can be friends. There's no such world, Polito. Oh, but of course there is. Your glass, senor. <laughs> I don't drink with fascists. You have uh, consorted with rabble too long, Mercer. Your manners are reflected. My manners are likely to get worse if I consort with your kind much longer, so let's get going. You said we would leave tonight. There's been a change of plans, Father. That's right. We're starting for the coast right away. Get your things. Very well. And Pelizzo. Yes? We'll be driving through fascist-held territory most of the way. You might be tempted to make a break for it. If you do, I promise I'll bring you back and personally hang you from that scaffold. We left then, I drove the car, Polizzo sat in back, but not Maria. She was beside me, very close beside me. Her perfume was heavy and sweet. Your thoughts are so far away, senor. Very far. <laughs> you do not like me, do you? No. You do not think I'm beautiful? Not nearly as beautiful as my thoughts. They are of another woman? No. What then? <laughs> A place called Vermont. It was night when we reached the main highway to Savona. Guido's partisans were far behind us by then, and I thought it would be clear sailing. I was wrong. What is the matter? Why do you slow down? Look up ahead. <sighs> Roadblock. Roadblock? Partisans? No, not partisans. This time it's your friends. Remember, Polizzo, I'm waiting for you to say just one wrong word. Let me see your papers. You're in the back seat first. Here they are. You will find them quite in order. I will be the judge of that. 
Alberto Pelizzo. Yes. So, you are Alberto Pelizzo, are you? Yes, I am. All right. Come with me, all three of you. But why? What is the matter? This man is lying. Alberto Pelizzo is dead. They led us to a small house down the road. The one with the rifle stayed with us while the other one disappeared into a back room. I was still watching Polizzo. I was still waiting for him to say that word. Here is the man, Major. The man who calls himself Alberto Pelizzo. Let me see him, Corporal. So, why should he not call himself Alberto Pelizzo? <laughs> you recognize me then, Major? But of course, senor, and I am delighted to see you. Our information was that you had been captured by partisans. I deeply apologize for the inconvenience you, uh, we may have caused you. No, no, no. Apologies are necessary, Major. And uh, now, may my daughter and I proceed to Savona? Certainly, senor. And uh, this man who is with you? Oh, uh, this man? See, si. You wish him to accompany you, senor? Uh... Well, well, yes, of course. This man is my chauffeur. I didn't get it. I didn't understand why he'd done it. Not until we'd started toward the car. The major who escorted us walked ahead with Maria. I dropped back to have a little private talk with Peluzzo. You uh, could have turned me over to them, but you didn't. It wasn't out of the kindness of your heart, I'm sure. Why else, Mercer? You have been kind to us. We are kind to you. No fascist was ever kind for a reason like that. Can you think of another reason? Mm -hmm. Maybe. You uh, have no way of leaving Italy without me. You know the war is lost. If you're still here when the Allies march into Rome, you won't have any way to save your precious skin. You want to get out while you can. <laughs> You're no fool, Senor Mercer. You can understand my reasoning, can't you? Sure, I can understand. It's an old story. Rats always desert a sinking ship. Why, you insult easy, easy, watch it, the Major. I was just telling your charming daughter, Senor Pelicio, that there is really no need for you to go to Savona. Huh? After tomorrow night, you could return to your village, Sturza. The partisans have taken Sturza, Major. And not for long, Senor. A full division of our infantry is on its way from Genoa to carry out a surprise attack on them. We are going to deal with this bandit Guido Gardone once and for all. Within 48 hours, it will be Guido Gordoni himself who will be hanging from that scaffold in the village square. That gave me something to think about the rest of the way. I kept on thinking about it all the next day, and I thought of Vermont, too. Yes, I thought a lot about Vermont and how those trees would look in the fall. To anybody who was lucky enough to see them... The roar of the surf against a lonely stretch of beach below Savona drowned the noise of the PT boat's motors. We didn't hear it, but we saw it lying offshore. The dinghy it put over its side scraped against the hard sand of the beach. Lieutenant Mercer? Yes? Olson's mate Curtis, sir. Do these people go aboard too, Lieutenant? Oh, yes, yes. Here's a letter. Give it to your skipper. It explains who they are. Yes, sir. But, uh, but aren't you coming, sir? No. Senor Mercer, you're not going with us? I don't understand. I think I do, Maria. The noble Signor Mercer is going back to warn his friends in Sturz of the surprise attack. That's right, Polito. Oh, no, Signor. Why should you bother with that rabble? They happen to be my allies. But you said they would kill you if they saw you again. They will. I am hoping they'll listen to my warning anyway. But that is foolish to risk your life for them. It does not make sense. It wouldn't to you, Maria. Not yet. Maybe after you've been in America for a while, it will. Take him away, Curtis. Yes, sir. <laughs> So I didn't go to Vermont. I went back to Sturza instead. It was noon the next day when I walked into the tavern. Guido was there. And Rosa. Roberto, you've come back. Yes, I've come back. Well, well, the traitor returns. Maybe you didn't believe me when I said I'd kill you. I believed you, Guido. Rico, take his gun. <laughs> that won't be necessary, Rico. Here's my gun. Roberto. Quiet, Rosa. 
You're ready to die, traitor? As soon as I've given you my report. There's a full division of fascist infantry moving up from Genoa. They're planning to spring a trap tonight. You'd better get out of Sturza. I don't believe you. The fascists are too busy at Salerno to send a division here. All right, I'll tell my best, Guido, if you don't believe me. I believe him, What Guido. are you doing, Rosa? Get away from him. No. Get out of the way. I tell you I'm going to kill him. Then you'll have to kill me, too. Rosa! I... Very well. We will see if you're right about him, Rosa. Rico, we're moving out of Sturza immediately. Pass the order along. See, si, Guido. But what about Roberto? What will you do with him? We'll take Roberto with us. If the fascisti do not attack tonight... There will be no more room on the scaffold tomorrow. The fascists did attack that night, but there wasn't a partisan left in Sturza. We had evaporated into the hills. Yes, I said we. I went on working with Guido Gordoni, helping to direct the campaign against the Blackshirts. We were never friends, Guido and I, but we did have a common enemy. A year later, I got back to Vermont. That was a long time to wait, but not as long as I might have waited if Alberto Polizzo had not given information concerning secret weapons to the OSS. And once again, the report of an OSS agent closes with the words, Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak and Dagger. Heard in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Robert Messer was Grant Richards, Guido Arnold Moss, Alberto Pelizzo, Louis Van Ruten. Script was written by Ken Field and music was under the direction of John Garth. Sound effects by Max Russell and Al Finelli. Engineering, Don Abbott. Today's OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBade. This program is produced by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Sunday.